What's happening guys, my name is Nicholas Renat and in this video we're going to be teaching a reinforcement learning agent, or AI, to be able to play Doom. Let's take a deep look at what we'll be going through. Alrighty, so what is it exactly that we're going to be going through in this video? Well, there's actually a ton of stuff and we're actually going to be treating it like a client and developer relationship as per usual, so you get a feel for how to explain some of these concepts to people that aren't necessarily data scientists or developers or machine learning engineers, so on and so forth. All right, so the first thing that we're going to be doing is setting up VizDoom. So this is a visual environment that allows you to play Doom using Python and other programming languages. What we're then going to do is we're going to wrap it inside of the OpenAI Gym framework. So this is going to allow us to actually build machine learning models to play around with the game. Then we'll get to the good bit. So we'll actually train a reinforcement learning agent using the PPO algorithm. Now stick around because I've actually got a detailed explanation for how PPO works. We've sort of glossed over it before, but we're gonna dive into the details in this video. We're then gonna change the levels that VizDoom is currently playing on. So before we might train on a simple level, we can then change it and play something a little bit more complex. And then I'm gonna show you one of the most important techniques that I've found when it comes to reinforcement learning. That is reward shaping, so how to shape your rewards to be able to produce good results and curriculum learning, which I'll talk about a little bit later. On that note, ready to do it? Let's get to it. Hey Nick, do you play Doom? Nah man, not in ages, Bob. Dude, check out VizDoom. You can use it and actually integrate it with Python. Hmm, all right, we'll do. Alrighty, so Bob's asked us to check out VizDoom. So that's exactly what we're going to do. To get VizDoom up and running, we need to install it into our Python environment. This is pretty straightforward using the command pip install VizDoom. Let's get some. Alrighty guys, so Bob's gone and asked us to go on ahead and get VizDoom up and running. So that's exactly what we're going to do up here. Now the cool thing about VizDoom is that it is a full featured, well, you can see it there, full featured AI research platform for reinforcement learning. But the cool thing about it is that it is super extensible and there's a ton of stuff that you can actually do with it. Uh, in this particular case, we're gonna be using it for exactly that, doing some RL. Now, in order to go on ahead and install it, you just need to go over to the GitHub repository. Now it is M-W-Y-D-M-U-C-H forward slash VizDoom. So this is Mark Widmuch. Um, so again, I'm, it's the first time I actually pronounced that. So Marek, if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, let me know. Um, but I do thank you very much for this VizDoom repository because it's absolutely awesome. Now, the thing that we need to do is actually go on ahead and install VizDoom. So we're going to go on ahead and leverage Marek's uh, environment or package. And to do that, I'm on a Windows machine, so we can just run pip install VizDoom. If you're on a Mac machine or a Mac OS machine, you've got to run this brew install command beforehand. If you're on Ubuntu, then you're going to need to run this. I'm going to include a link to this GitHub repo in the description below if you want to pick this up, as well as the VizDoom uh, documentation. Cool. So what we need to do now is run pip install VizDoom to get that installed into our Python environment. So we can just run a or create a new cell and run pip install VizDoom. And that's going to go on ahead and install VizDoom. So I've already got it installed. So it went relatively quickly, but let me quickly walk you through that command. So it's exclamation mark pip install VizDoom. And that's going to install it into your environment so you can actually start working with it. Now that that is done, oh, we've just collapse that. Now that that's done, the next thing that we need to do is actually go on ahead and clone this GitHub repository. So we've got a ton of stuff in that we need in here, but specifically inside of this scenarios folder, we've got all of these configurations. Now these configurations are what allow us to fine tune what we want our Doom level or map to actually be. Now you can actually go in ahead and create custom versions of these. We're just going to be using the ones that are inside of the repo, at least for now. So we're going to be using this basic environment, um, but you can see that it's got a scenario path, what map we want to use, um, what we want our reward to look like. We're going to touch on that a lot more later, uh, as well as a whole bunch of rendering options, when our episode starts, when our episode times out, the buttons that we've got available, really, really important when it comes to action. So we can move left, move right and attack as well as any game variables that we've got available, uh, what mode, and then Doom skill. So this is really important for curriculum learning, which we'll talk about later. Okay, but for now, what we need to do is go on ahead and clone this repo. So 
first things first, let's create a subfolder to house this. So inside of the folder that I'm currently working in, I'm just going to create a new folder and I'm going to call that. Let me zoom in because this is super small. So I'm going to create a new folder. Oh, where's new? New. Nope. New. Oh my God. This is nightmare. All right. New. And then GitHub. <clears throat> so I'm just going to call this GitHub. Um, and the reason that I'm creating this is so that we've got a separate isolated folder to hold all of our github stuff so we're going to be having a lot of stuff inside of this repository so keeping it nice and clean is going to make our lives a little bit easier so what we now want to do is clone this repository into that folder <clears throat> sorry i'm losing my voice so i'm going to create a or run a separate command and that is going to be cd github so keep in mind that this jupyter notebook that i'm working in right now is in that root level folder so first up, we need to go into that GitHub folder and then we're going to run git clone and then we are going to be cloning this repository. So the full line is exclamation mark cd github and git clone and then we've passed through the full link to this GitHub repository. So if I go on ahead and run this, it's going to start cloning that down. So if we go into the GitHub folder, you can see that it's now starting to clone into there. So we'll give that a second, let it go on ahead and finish cloning. And then we'll be able to kick things off five minutes later okay so that is the visdom github repository now cloned so if we go into there you can see that we've got all of our stuff including these scenarios which we're going to need in a sec so everything that you saw inside of the github repo we've got those available here now that that's done what we actually want to go on ahead and do is import a couple of dependencies because we're going to need some stuff to actually be able to work with our environment. So namely, we are going to need to import VisDoom itself. We're going to need the random repos or the random module to be able to take random actions. And I think we're also going to need time. And this just gives us the option to sleep between frames, give us a little bit of time to visualize what's actually happening with VisDoom. So let's go on ahead and do this. Okay, those are our dependencies now imported. So I've gone and written three lines, three lines of code there. So from VisZoom import star. So this is going to import all of our VisZoom dependencies. I've then gone and imported random. So import random. So that's going to allow us to take random actions. Now a little bit on the actions, right? So let's actually just jump back into that basic config. So if I go into YouTube and then VisZoom and then GitHub and then VisZoom and then scenarios. And then if I open up this basic folder no nope, that's not going to how do we there we go i'm trying to make the font a little bit bigger all right so inside of this config we've got this section here called available buttons these are going to be the buttons that our reinforcement learning agent has access to from visdom so if for example we wanted to use the move left action that's represented as uh, an array or a binary array so it's going to be one comma zero comma zero that is the action that we'd actually pass through to our environment to move left if we wanted to move right then we'd be passing through zero one zero if we wanted to attack then again it's going to be something similar but this time we're going to be passing through a binary one inside of the last column so these three or commands or arrays map through to these three actions so we're going to be randomly taking these actions at least initially but later on we're going to be able to train our reinforcement learning agent to know which one to take in order to maximize our return uh, but for now we don't need to know any more than that we're going to be playing around with it in a sec okay so we've gone and imported random and then we've gone and imported time one thing that you'll notice is that this environment runs hyper quick that is a key advantage of VisDoom. It trains really, really fast and you get a really high frame per second rate. So we ideally want to be able to show this to some potential users or people that actually want to see our game environment. So by importing time, we're going to sleep and at least give ourselves a little bit of time between frames to see what our agent is actually doing. Okay, now that that is imported, the next thing that we can actually do is at least initialize our game and load our config. So let's actually go on ahead and do this.
Okay, so that is our game now set up. So I've gone and written three lines of code there. So the first one is creating a game instance. So I've written game equals Doom game. So this is coming from the VizDoom class. So it's capital D O O M capital G A M E. So Doom game, and then inside, and then we've added a set of parentheses to initialize the class. And then I've gone and written game dot load underscore config. This is what actually allows us to load up these configs that I've been harping on about. So you can see that we've got basic.config, all of those there. That is actually what allows us to load up that specific configuration, which defines our map, our reward, our button, so on and so forth. So this line is actually loading that into the game. And then by running game.init, we're actually starting it up. And what you might have noticed is that we've actually got VizDoom happening at the back over here. So this is actually our game environment. Now it is a bit small. That's just the, the frame size. You can configure this inside of the config. That's our game now started. Now, you're probably thinking, Nick, that that's great, but I actually want to do something in it. So that's exactly what we're going to do now. So we're going to start taking some random actions. Now, first up, what we want to do is create a set of actions, because right now all we've got is we or we haven't actually gone and created some actions that our agent can take. So to do that, I'm going to import NumPy. import numpy for uh, identity matrix and i'm going to uh, what are we doing cut that paste that over there so numpy is going to give us a quick way to build up that array matrix that i was showing you so what i can do is type in actions equals mp.identity and pass through three and if we type in actions now that is effectively our set of arrays. Now, do we need to make these and we let's make them integers. Uh, D type equals MP dot U int eight. Right. So that is effectively our set of different actions. Now, remember when we were taking a look at our basic configuration, we had three different actions. So move left, move right and attack. These are what our different actions represent. So action zero or index zero. It's going to be move left, index one, move right. And the last one is going to be attack. So we can now randomly choose from this set of actions using our random package that we brought in up here. So I think it's random.choice. So you can see we're now taking random actions from our identity matrix. So for now, what we're going to be doing is using random.choice to just take random actions because we don't exactly have a smart agent. So let's just uh, add some comments here. So this is the set of actions we can take in the environment. Uh, and so this random.choice is effectively going to be what we actually use to take random actions inside of that Doom game effectively. Now, it's obviously going to perform like crap because there's no actual set of smarts which is actually gone and being applied here so at least it shows us what our game actually looks like so let's go on ahead and set up a bit of a loop to actually start playing our game and then we're going to be able to take our random actions and apply them to our game so let's do this Okay, before I go any further, let's actually take a look at what we've written here. So first up, what we're defining is a new variable called episodes, and I've set that equal to 10. So this basically means that we're going to play 10 games, or at least initially we're, while we're trialing this out. What we're then doing is we're looping through each episode. So for episode in range episodes, so this is effectively going to loop 10 times. And we are now creating a new episode. So game dot new episode. So this is like restarting the game or starting doom all over again and uh, initially starting from scratch so game dot new episode is going to be what allows us to do that then we're checking that our game is not done so effectively we're not dead and or we haven't actually gone and completed the level so while not game dot is episode finished so if i actually go and type that in um so game dot or we haven't actually created a new episode let's create a new episode game dot new episode right so that is a new episode or a new game. So that resets our environment. Now we can check game.is episode finished. 
And you can see that right now our game isn't finished. So we can still keep on going and still keep applying steps. Now let's actually, rather than looping through, let's actually just go and take some random actions to begin with. So we can actually type in game dot make action and then run random dot choice. Let me move this over. So we can see this happening side by side. Random dot choice dot actions. And this should effectively allow us to take random actions. So over here, we're getting our reward back. Let's go and run it again. So you can see that our agent is moving. So it's a little bit slow at the moment. You can see it's taking a shot. Right, cool. So you can see that that is moving a bit, a bit, a little bit slow at the moment. You can see that stuff is actually happening. Right, so this means that by using game.make underscore action and then passing through our random actions, we are effectively doing stuff inside of our game environment. Now doing it this way is a little bit slow so we can actually loop through. So let's quickly just recap on that one line there because that is quite important. So game.make action allows us to take an action and actually apply it inside of our game. So this is akin to just pressing buttons, right? Now, what we're going to do is we're effectively going to loop through and do this a little bit faster. So you can actually see what a set of random actions looks like inside of the game. Now, the goal here is to kill this monster over here. Uh, I think there is a set. Uh, yeah, inside of this readme, it actually tells you what the rewards are like. Let me go back. So if we take a look inside of our documentation, so you can see that this is the information about the basic environment. So the purpose of this scenario is just to check if using the framework to train some AI in a 3D environment is feasible. The map is a rectangle with gray walls, blah, blah, blah. All right, so we're really, uh, let's actually read it. So the player is spawned along the longer wall in the center, a red circular monster is spawned randomly somewhere along the opposite wall. So that's that dude over there. The player can only go left, right and shoot. One hit is enough to kill the monster. The episode finishes when the monster is killed or on timeout. Now the rewards that we're going to get, so we're going to get 101 points for killing that dude over there. We're going to lose five points for missing. So this is if we shoot and we don't actually hit the monster, we're going to lose five points. So because we're effectively wasting ammo. Then we've also got some additional rewards. So we lose uh, one point for every step that we aren't killing our monster got three buttons and we've got 300 frames to go on ahead and kill that dude. So let's go on ahead and loop through this and run a, a whole game. So let's do it. Okay, so I've gone and written a bunch of extra lines of code here. But for now, let's actually go and test this out and see what happens. So if we go and run this, we've got an error. Uh, name episode is not defined for episode in range. Oh, this should be episodes over here. All right, so you can see that that is running super quickly. You can see our agent is actually doing stuff now. So he's taking random actions. And you can see that we're losing, or we're losing one life for every step that we don't kill it. All right, it's going to kill it. Boom. All right, so we should have got a bigger reward for that. So you can see that we got 100 there. So that's because we actually went and killed the monster. Now you're probably thinking, why isn't it 101? Because remember, we lose one point for every step that we are currently living. And this incentivizes our agent to do it quick and effectively kill the monster quick. Uh, but you can see that this is effectively the agent playing, right? So he's going around taking random shots and we can actually see our reward down here. All right, so we can keep leaving that plane, but it's just going to go 10 times. So we don't actually need to keep watching that. Now, I think we can run game.close. And that's going to close that down as well. Cool. All right, let's take a look at what we wrote here. So first up, we are looping through our episodes. Loop through episodes. And those are these two lines over here. Then we're creating a new episode. New episode or game. We're checking that our game isn't finished. And so what we've written there is while not game dot is underscore episode underscore finished and then a set of parentheses and a colon. 
then what we're doing is we're getting some information about our game. So first up, we're getting our game state. Now this should ideally be the actual frame from our game. Now, I don't think our game is initialized. So if I run game.getState, uh, we don't get anything back because we don't actually have a game currently initialized. So let's just uh, clean this up a little bit. So if I delete that, 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 let's actually go and create a new game. Now, if I run game.getState, there you go. So that is our state. So if I write type state equals game.getState, and then state dot there is a whole bunch of information that we're actually able to get from this state. Now, the most important one is the screen buffer. So this is actually the game frame or effectively that image. So you can see that VizDoom is back up and running. By running state.screen underscore buffer, we're actually able to get the image that you can see there, which is what we're doing over here. So state equals game.get underscore state. <laughs> So state equals game dot get underscore state. And then what we're able to do is actually get the image. So image equals state dot screen underscore buffer is getting that specific image there. Then we can get some game variables from that state as well. So if I run state dot game underscore variables, so you can see we're getting 50. Now that 50 maps to what we're actually setting in our configuration. So that is the ammo. So the info is actually the set of available game variables. So available underscore game underscore variables equals ammo, right? So that 50 that you can see there is the 50 that you can see. Let me zoom in so you can see it. Is that 50 over there? Now this gives us a lot of options, right? Because we can actually get a bunch of different game variables and use that to incentivize our agent. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we've got our game variables. So we've written info equals state dot game underscore variables. And then we're actually going and taking our action, which is what we were doing before, right? So game dot make underscore action. And then we're passing through random dot choice and then passing through actions. I'm going to show you one extra thing there in a second. But for now, let's keep taking a look at what we've written. So let's uh, add some comments. So we are getting our state. Then we are getting the game image, get the game variables. In this case, it's ammo. Then we're taking an action. And okay, so we're up to there for now. So reward is what we're gonna get back whenever we make an action. So game dot make underscore action. And then we're ta just taking random actions for now. And then we're actually able to print out our reward. Print reward. And remember, our reward is going to be defined over here. So you get 101 points for killing the monster, five for missing. So if you take a shot and don't kill, you minus five, and that incentivizes us to conserve ammo, right? Then we can print out our reward, which is what I've written here. So print, and then I've passed through the string reward, comma, reward. So it's going to print out a string reward and then the actual reward itself. We're then taking a brief break. So I've written time.sleep, and then we're taking a 0 0.02 millisecond break. And then we're printing out the full game reward. So this is the reward for taking one step. This is our overall points for the entire game. So to get that, we can type in game.get underscore total underscore reward. And that is going to give us the full game points. And then we can take a longer sleep between games. So this gives us a chance to actually take a bit of a break. Now, a really important thing is when you're actually going and building these environments or building these agents is a concept called frame skip. Now, keep in mind when you actually take an action, it might take a little bit of time for you to see the result of that action. So if we go and try to shoot at the agent, it's not immediately going, the bullet's not immediately going to reach the monster, right? So we can actually set a parameter called frame skip to actually give us a little bit of a buffer between when we take that action and the end results. Now, in order to do that, inside of game.makeAction, we can pass through this second parameter. So if, let me actually show you this. So game.makeAction. Uh, so it doesn't actually tell you. Or what, well, I'm going to tell you. So the second parameter inside of make action is actually that frame skip. So this means that when we're going to take an action, we're going to skip the next four frames and then return that result. So this is actually going to give our agent or our bot some time to actually see the result of taking that action. So if we go and run this loop now, let's actually close that game that's up there. Let's uh, reinitialize and then run this loop. So you can see it's a little bit more jittery and that's because we're skipping frames. 
can make this a bit bigger so you can see it. And so by passing through that frame skip parameter, we're effectively going to see the result or result at least a little bit quicker than what we would have if we were to not frame skip because we'd take a shot and we wouldn't necessarily see whether or not that's gone and killed our monster. So this gives us a little bit of time to see that reward and associate that reward with that action. Cool. All right, so that's going on. Okay, so we've effectively gone and got Vizdoom up and running now. So it took a little bit of time and there's a bunch of stuff that you need to get your head around, but that is effectively Vizdoom up and running. So let's quickly recap. So we went and installed Vizdoom. We went and cloned down the GitHub repo. And remember, you've got those scenarios in there, which are really, really important. We've then gone and imported our dependencies. We've set up our game. We took a look at how we can specify our actions and what's actually available inside of our game configuration. And then we went and wrote this loop, which effectively allows us to play with a random agent inside of our VizDoom environment. Let's go on ahead now and show Bob what we've done. So what'd you think of VizDoom, man? Yeah, it's all right, but the game itself isn't quite wrapped and ready for machine learning. What do you mean? Well, normally to be able to do cool stuff with games, we need to set up our environment to be able to apply reinforcement learning. Now, the most popular library for this is OpenAI Gym. VizDoom by default isn't actually wrapped and ready for that. Think you can do it? Is that a challenge? Maybe. All right, let's do it. So we've got it working, but as per usual, we've got more client requirements. In order to AI this, we're gonna to need to get it into an open AI gym environment. We can wrap it inside the environment using the open AI gym base class. This will give us a bunch more flexibility when it comes to pre-processing and working with the game frames and rewards. While we're at it, we'll also grayscale the game observations and cut out the game info bar at the bottom. This helps train the model faster as there are less pixels to process. So Bob's now interested in actually getting this set up to actually do a little bit of reinforcement learning. So this is where we're actually going to need to start using OpenAI Gym. Now there are different frameworks, but to be honest, OpenAI Gym is the best one that I've found. We're going to be using this and effectively wrapping up VizDoom inside of that environment. Now I think there is actually a library out there that allows you to use VizDoom with OpenAI Gym without doing much config, but I think it's really good practice to actually get your head around how to actually do this because you're going to understand a little bit better how the OpenAI Gym framework actually works. Okay, so now we are up to step two. So that is step one now done. We're doing step two. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is actually go on ahead and install OpenAI Gym. So if we take a look at our documentation, to get it up and running, we just need to run pip install gym. So that's exactly what we're going to go on ahead and do. So inside of a new cell, I'm just going to write pip install gym. And you can see I've already got it installed. So it went relatively quickly, but the full line is exclamation mark pip install gym. So this is going to be what allows us to actually wrap our framework or wrap our VizDoom environment inside of the open AI gym framework. Cool. Now that that's done, the next thing that we need to do is actually go on ahead and import some dependencies. So the main dependencies that we're going to need is OpenAI Gym. We're also going to need to import a couple of things called spaces. So these are just the way that we define the shapes from our environment. Now, the two main ones that we actually work with are box and discrete. So box is effectively an array of any shape and discrete is just a set of discrete binary actions. Okay, so let's go on ahead and import some dependencies. Okay, so we've gone and written three lines of code there. So from gym import env. So this is going to give us our OpenAI gym base class. We've then gone and imported our three different space or our two different spaces. So from gym dot spaces import discrete and box. Now let me quickly give you an example of what these are. So if I type in discrete uh, three, so that is our space. I can then type in sample. And so what this is going to give us is either one or zero, one or two. Now these represent the different actions that we've actually got available. Now, what this is going to then be used for is if we go and type in action, and then if I go and pass through this, 
we uh wait it's actions so this is effectively randomly sampling from our action space which is what we had over here so our discrete space is going to be what we define our action as and then we're actually able to sample from these different actions so we're actually going to be using this to select a specific action so you'll actually see this in more detail but just know for now that discrete is either is effectively an identifier or an index uh, when we actually go and define that as a space. Uh, box is a little bit different. It can be an array of any shape. So typically when you define box, you define a low value. So we'll say, um, I don't know, let's say zero, a high value, let's say 10, and then a shape, um, let's say 10 by 10. Need to close that. And then we can type in sample. So you can see we're now getting an array and that array is going to be of the shape 10 by 10 and our low value is going to be zero and our high value is going to be 10. We can also specify um, D type, I think. So np.uint8, uh, int right? So now we're getting an array, which is 10 by 10, which has a NumPy uh, or a D type of a NumPy unsigned integer of eight bits. So you can see that we've got all of these values. Now, when we actually go and define this for open, uh, for our Doom space, I think it's, what is it? I think it's 320 by 240 or something along those lines. So this just gives us a much bigger image. And rather than our low value being zero, our high value or our low value stays is zero. High value is then 255. So this is then an actual image. Cool. But you'll see this in more detail in a sec. So let's get rid of that. Okay. So those are our dependencies imported. That spaces. Then we've also imported OpenCV, so I've imported CV2. So this just gives us our, um, or this is going to be used for grayscaling our observations. That actually makes it faster to actually go and process our Doom environment. Okay, so I think those are our three key dependencies now imported. So we've imported the environment-based class, discrete and box, and we've also imported OpenCV. Okay, so now that that's done, the next thing that we want to do is start defining our VizDoom environment class. So let's go on ahead and do this. So I'm going to set up a base class and then we can start filling it out. So let's do it. Okay, so that is our baseline framework now set up. So again, I've just gone and defined the functions and the class. We haven't actually gone and filled this out yet. So we're going to do this step by step. So what I've written is class, and then I've defined that as viz doom gym with uh, uppercases for or camel case. So viz in caps, doom in caps, and then gym in caps. And then to that, we're going to be passing through our open AI gym base class. So the full line is class this doom gym and then inside of parentheses e and v and then colon then what we've gone and defined so that is our base class defined over here right so that is the main line then what i've gone and defined is what is that one two three four five six different functions that we're going then going to fill out so the first one is init so this is what happens when our environment is initially started up so the function let's actually add some comments function that is called when we start the env right so inside of our init function we are going to do all of the stuff that we need to effectively start our game so it's really going to be game.new episode it's going to be setting up our different spaces so on and so forth then we've defined a step function so def step and then we've passed through self and then action again don't don't focus on this for now i'm just going to give you an understanding of what each one of these functions or each one of these methods are used for so this is how we take a step in the environment uh, we've then got close this is a little less important so i'm just going to put this down here for now because we can come back to that later uh, so then what is the next most important? So let's put that down there as well. So I'm just going to reorder some of these. Okay. So then we've got our render function. So we actually, I've just defined this for, uh, to ensure that we meet all the requirements for a VizDo or an open AI gym environment. 
we don't actually need to define the render function because that's already predefined inside of VizDoom. So um, this is going to stay as a pass for now, but this is where you'd normally uh, define how to render the game or environment. We don't really need to do this for now because Open or VizDoom actually does it for us. Reset is what happens when we start a new game. So the init is, function is what happens when we create the environment. Reset is what we call to start a new game. Uh, grayscale is a custom one, so we don't need... This isn't typically included inside of OpenAI Gym environments, but we're going to create it. So we are going to use this to grayscale the game frame and resize it as well. And then close. So this is what we're going to call to close down the game so you you saw how we have the frame that sort of pops up so we're going to define a method that allows us to actually close that game down so that it's not floating there the entire time okay so the first thing that we need to do is actually go and define our init function now the nice thing about this is that we've pretty much got a lot of that code already floating around over here so specifically we need these three lines of code so I'm just going to copy these over. So the setup that we had over here, and we're going to bring this into our init function and clean it up a little bit. So let's actually go on ahead and do that. Okay, so we've gone and brought in those three lines into our init function, and I've got rid of the pass line. So I've written self.game equals doom game. So this is going to create our new game instance. Then I've written self.game.load underscore config, and this is going to be passing through our basic config. So later on, when we want to use different environments, we could change that line there. Then I've written self.game.init, and this is going to create or initialize our initial game environment. So now that that's done, the next thing that we actually want to do is create our action or our observation space and our action space so we are going to create two new uh, variables or two new properties to self dot observation space and we're going to set that equal to box and the low value is going to be uh, zero high value is going to be 255 and then we need to define the shape so uh, let's go and take a look do we have a game running yep okay so game dot get state Dot screen buffer okay so it's not currently running that's fine so let's go and create a new game and then we're going to create a new episode wait do we have the game frame up and running now okay so what i'm trying to do at the moment let me actually explain the the theory behind what i'm doing is i'm trying to get how big the actual game frame currently is so we actually want to be able to pass through the shape down here so let's go and get that so game let's actually do it here so we've got a game running so i can type in game dot get state all right and then to get our image we can type in screen buffer buffer and then just dot shape okay so right now our shape is 3 comma 240 by 320 so we can pass that through so is that right yeah let's try that it should be 240 by 320 by 3. Uh, 3. And then we're going to pass through dtype equals mp.uint8. Okay, so that is our observation space now defined. Now, the nice thing about this is that I'm going to, there's actually a environment checker that you can actually use from stable baselines, which is something we'll talk about in a second that we can actually use to validate whether or not we've defined our environment correctly. So don't fret if you're not too sure how this is actually working. We can actually check it out later on. Or we can actually check that our environment is going to be correct. All right, now, now that that's done, the next thing that we need to do is actually define our action space. So self.action space equals discrete, and it's just gonna be three. Pretty straightforward. Okay, cool. So this is create set up the game. Create the action space and observation space. All right, I think that's okay for now. Let's actually test this out. So 
if we go and create a VizDoom environment, there's still going to be a bunch of stuff that we need to initialize. But if we now go and type in env.observation space, we've actually got the shape of that environment. So we've got 0, 255, 240 by 320. We can take a look at our action space. And this is discrete. Let's just double check our observation space uh, shape. So dot sample. Sometimes the order is a little bit weird. All right, so 240 by 320 by 3. Is that matching what we had up here? 240 by 320 by 3. Okay, so we're good. Does it need to be... I wonder if we need to have the channels first. We can actually rechange it. So we'll just put the channels first. So you can see there that the shape that we've got is 3 by 240 by 320. We had 240 by 320 by 3. So I'm just going to rearrange that. So now you can see our observation shape is the exact same as what we've got from over here. Cool. So we've now got self.observation space equals box. And then we've specified our low value, which is the pixel minimum. We've got our high value, which is our pixel maximum. We've then got our shape, which is equal to 3, 240, 320. And then we've also gone and specified our data type, which is going to be a NumPy unsigned 8-bit integer. Then we've gone and defined our action space, a self.actions underscore space equals discrete three. Cool. All right. Now let's take a look. So you can see that each time we're creating one of these VizDoom environments, we're going and spinning this up. But we want to have some sort of way to close it because now that we've gone and encapsulated it inside of our VizDoom gym, I don't know whether or not we can just run game.close. I might close one of them. So let's close one of them. But if we go and run it again not happening right so we want to have let's go on ahead and define our close function so we can actually close down our game okay so that is our close function now done so i've, written, I've gone and passed through the self so that the, our own instance and then run self.game.close so that should effectively allow us to go on ahead and close our instance now let's go and hard shut these ones that we've already got up here so if we go into our task manager and you can see that uh, I've got all these VizDoom instances or ZDoom instances up and running there. So you can see those. We can just end those tasks. So end as the next one. End. End. Cool. All right. So those are now closed. So you can see that they're done there. So let's go and create our next VizDoom instance. So that's up and running. You can see we've got it over there. Now if we go and run game. Uh, let's actually run env.close now. You can see it's shutting it down gracefully. Okay, so that is that part of the environment now done. So we've gone and done the init function, which we've gone and set up how we create a game and how we create and define our observation and action space. There's actually one more thing that I want to do inside of this init function, and that is define whether or not we want to render our game. Now, the reason that we define this is when we actually go and train our environment, rendering is going to take a lot more compute away from our training so if we disable rendering while we're actually training it's going to train a whole heap faster so let's go and pass through an argument to our init function so we're going to specify render and by default we're going to set this equal to false and then we just need to have some conditions inside of this init function to define whether or not we want to spin it up or whether or not we don't want to actually render so let's go ahead and define this Okay, that is our render frame logic now applied. Now, the only other thing that we need to do is we just need to move the self.game.init method or function call from up here to below this. Cool. All right, so let's take a look at what we wrote there. So I've written if render equals false, and this is a new argument or a new keyword argument that we're going to be passing through to our init method so if render equals false self.game.set underscore window underscore visible equal to false so this is basically going to say hey don't pop up that window we don't want to see that so just start up the game in the background so we can actually go on ahead and train else 
self.game.window or self.game.set underscore window underscore visible equal to true. So one is going to enable us to see the window. One is going to, or this is going to disable us seeing the window. This is going to allow us to see the window. And then we're moving this down because we only want to start it up once we've actually gone and set that parameter. So start the game. Cool. I think that is that now done. Let's just make sure we don't have any instances running. So we're good there. Uh, hold on. Uh, this should be, God, rookie error. This should be equals equals false, not equals. God, Nick, terrible. All right, so now if we go and start up our instance, get rid of that. Oh, wait, why did I close it? Start, start up our instance. So you can see it's not rendering, right? So we don't actually have VizDoom running down here anymore. But if I go to our task manager, it will actually, in fact, be running in the background. Um, so it should be ZDoom. So you can see that we've actually got an instance over there. Right? So it, it is running. It's just not rendering. So if we go and close it, and if we go and pass through uh, render equals to true now, you can see we've got this little bad boy running. Right? So all well and good. So we've now got the ability to enable render and disable render. Okay, we're going to set that equal to, let's leave that as true for now. All right, so we're going to close it. All right, so what have we gone and done? So we've now gone and fully completed our init method. We've also gone and set up our close. So now what we need to do is finish off our step function, our reset function, and our grayscale. So let's go on ahead and do our step function. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is we want to define our actions that we're actually going to be able to take. So we're going to create actions equals mp.identity. And we're going to set that equal to three, which is effectively what we had right up here. So we can actually just copy this line. Paste that there. And then we want to define what we're actually going to do. So we can type in reward, or we actually want to take a step. Equals env dot make action. Actually, it should be self dot game dot make make action. And then we are going to be passing through actions, the specified action that we want to take. So when we actually go and take pass through this action here, it's going to be either zero, one, or two. Now we need to convert that into those arrays that we had, remember? So the arrays that we had from over here. Let's take a look at actions. So we are going to be getting either a zero, a one, or a two. So a zero is going to give us this action. A one is going to give us this action and a two is going to give us that action. So either move left, move right, or shoot. So what we are doing here is we are taking the action that comes through in our step function. We're passing it through our actions identity matrix, which is going to be those arrays. And we're going to be making that action. So remember self.game.make action, which is exactly how we took an action over here. And remember, we need to set our frame skip parameter. So we are going to do that. So comma four. Cool. All right, so that means we've now got our action, we've done our reward, what else do we need? So we need our next observation and we need our game info. So what we're actually gonna be returning from this function, so we wanna return uh, the, normally we return state reward, and then what else do we, uh, state reward, whether or not we're done and our info. Okay, cool. So that's what we need to get out of this step function. So to get our game state, we just go uh, state equals game dot state uh, get state. Self dot game dot get is a get state. Yep. And then to get our image, we get uh, image equals state dot screen buffer. So our image is what we're going to be reply or passing back through to here. So we actually want this to be our image. And then we want to check whether or not we're done. So we can check whether or not we're done by grabbing this parameter here. So game dot is episode fi finished. So done equals game dot or self dot game dot is episode finished. And then what else do we need? So we need our info. Uh, so we need info. 
and that's going to come from our state state How do we get our game variables again? It's game dot game variables. There we go. Okay, let's check that. So what have we gone and done? So we've gone and defined our actions. So let's add some comments. So uh, take or specify action and take step. So that's what these two lines are doing. So we're specifying our actions. We're then taking a step within our game. So our actions are defined as actions equals np.identity3 because we've got three different actions that we can take. And then we'll specify dtype equals np.u into 8. We've then defined our reward. So reward equals, or we're defining how we get back our reward from our game. So reward equals self.game.make underscore action. And then to that, we're passing through our actions array, which is being filtered by our action index, comma, 4, which actually gives us our frame skip parameter. Okay. And then here we're getting uh, get all the other stuff we need to return. And so the first thing that we're doing is we're getting our game state. Now this includes a, this doesn't actually return back the screen buffer. So we could actually just grab this, but we need our info. That's fine. We'll leave it as is. So our state equals self.game.getState. And then what we're doing is we're grabbing back our observation back. So image equals state.screen underscore buffer. This is actually the next frame that we're getting back from our game that we're getting in this line here. Then we're grabbing our info. So info equals state.game underscore variables, which we're going to be passing back through to here. And then we're getting whether or not we're done. So done equals self.game.is underscore episode underscore finished. Okay. So that is that now done. So let's test this out. So if we go and run this, Okay, so that all looks good. So we can type in emv.step and we should be able to pass through 0, 1, 2, or 3 and this return back all of that info. All right, that's looking good. You can see we're getting our game frame. We're getting back our reward. We're getting back whether or not we're done. And we're also getting back our ammo percentage. So if we go and take a different step now. So let's take step. Uh, let's actually shoot. So if we go and take step two, so that's us shooting. So you can see that he's shooting over there. Trying to get it to expand. No, it doesn't want to expand. All right, whatever. All right, so we can keep shooting. Okay, so now it looks like we've got a bit of an error. So it looks like... At the moment, we don't actually have a screen buffer. So what we should do, and this is because we've got to the end state. So we should actually apply a little bit of logic to ensure that we don't get this error because that's going to cause issues when it actually comes to training. So let's close this for now. And what we're going to do is when there is no screen buffer or state actually available, we're just going to return back zero so that we don't throw an error and crash the entire training cycle. So let's actually fix this up over here. Okay, so that is looking okay. I'm not liking that we've got this image over here. This is kind of killing me that we're, we've got this line and we're not really using it. So what we can actually do, given the fact that we've gone and cleaned this up, so we're going to change state equals to self.game.getState. We're just going to append .screen buffer to it. That's going to clean that up. And then, so we can get rid of this image line. And then our info can just be self.game.getState.game variable. So that just makes it a little bit cleaner there. So then we're going to return back state down here. And this is going to be state over here as well. So that looks much cleaner. So state equals self.game.get underscore state dot screen buffer. Info equals self.game.get underscore state dot game variables. Okay, now let me tell, show you what I've actually gone and done for this logic bit here. So if we don't have anything being returned from game.getState or it's zeros, what we're then going to return is a numpy zeros array. So np.zeros and then the shape that we're passing through to that is self.observation underscore space dot shape. So rather than returning through an actual game observation, it's just going to be an array filled with zeros. 
and our info is just going to be a value of zero. And then I've moved done a little bit further down. So done equals self dot game dot is episode finished. Okay. So now if we try running this, let's have a look. So we're going to render again. Let's keep going. Okay. So it doesn't look like it's throwing errors. So we're good now. Cool. Okay, so now we know that we're done. So we're returning back true. We've got our reward and we're not getting any errors. So that is all looking much better. So we can close that down. That is our step function now defined. Now, the next thing that we're going to need to do is define our... Do, 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 do. Let's actually do our reset function. Okay, so inside of our reset function, we are going to run... So we need to pass through self. And we're going to say uh, self dot game dot what is it again? Uh, it should be do, 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 uh, do, do. how do we create a new game? New episode. So let's pass that down here. Self dot game dot new episode, and we are going to get back our state from here. And we should just return state. I think that's good. Okay. So if we create our environment, env.reset, it actually get our state. That is not returning anything. Close this down. Oh, because it's not actually going to return that state. So this is going to create a new instance. So we need to run self.game.getState.screen buffer. Let's try that now. Okay, that looks much better. We've now got our frame. It's all looking good. If we take a step, 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 close. Uh, we're getting controlled viz doom. Oh, we've gone and closed it down. Now we're getting thrown a bunch of errors. So if we go and create a new instance, reset, state, step, 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 step. Just test this out. This looks like it's working fine. Okay, you sort of get the idea. So that looks like it is running successfully. All right, what else is left to do? So we've now gone and returned our screen buffer. We've gone and defined our reset function. The next thing that we should probably do is define our grayscaling function. So what we're effectively going to be doing here is we are going to grayscale our image and we're also going to resize it. So by doing that, we're also going to need to reshape our observation space. All right, so the last thing that we need to do is go on ahead and grayscale our image. So at the moment, we are capturing all of the colors and we're also capturing the bottom bit of the, the game. That's not actually going to add value when we actually go and train a reinforcement learning agent. So we can actually cut that bit out. So that's exactly what we're going to do inside of our grayscale function. So let's actually go on ahead and do this. So we are going to be passing through self so we can grab our own instance and we are actually going to be passing through our observation. So this is effectively our game frame. So let's go on ahead and grayscale this and then we'll take a look at what we wrote. Okay, that is our grayscaling done so far. So we're going to do this step by step. So rather than just doing the resizing, we'll, we'll do this step by step. So first up, what I've gone is I've written def grayscale or the full function is def grayscale. And then to that, we're passing through our own instance. So self comma observation, which is going to be our gray game frame. Then I've written gray equals cv2.cvt color. If you've watched any of my OpenCV tutorials, you know that you have seen this a ton of times before. This allows you to change the color channels and the color orders. And then we're using np.moveAxis and we're just reshaping the actual array. So if I go and do we actually have a frame? So state, 
yes, yeah, so state.screenBuffer. Actually, we can just use this. So np. Let me show you the shape beforehand. So state.shape equals 3, 240 by 320, right? So if we go np.move axis, comma 0, comma negative 1. This is going to reorder where our channels are. So you can see that it's three right now. We've now gone and moved it to the end. And this is the format that the BGR or the CVT color method actually expects our image to be in. It's, the image is still going to work. It's just that the color channels are going to be at the end now when we go and apply this CV2.CVT color method. So the full line is gray equals CV2.CVT color. And then inside of that, we're in np.move axis. And then passing through our game frame observation, comma zero. So this is saying grab the first axis or the first channel, which is going to be the, our colors, and then move it to the end. So negative one, comma cv2.color underscore bgr2 gray. So this is effectively going to be grayscaling our image. Now, what we actually need to do is actually apply this method. We actually haven't actually gone and used it yet. So what we can do is find wherever we're actually grabbing our game frame and we just need to apply that grayscaling function so over here under step we need to we need to get state and run self dot grayscale and then pass through that state so this is effectively going to apply our grayscaling there and we should also do this inside of the reset method so we're going to say uh gray or state equals how should we do this Let's grab this and then we are going to return self.grayscale state. That should effectively work. Let's actually run this. So what I've gone and done is we've gone and fleshed out parts of the grayscale method. And then what we're going to be doing is we are going to be running or we've added an extra line inside of our step method. So state now equals state.self.game.getState.screenBuffer and then we're applying our grayscaling here and again all this code is going to be available in the description below so let me zoom out so you can see it a little bit better right so this is our full class what we're doing is we're applying grayscaling here and we're also applying grayscaling down here so if we go and run this now so run our environment let's take a look at our state so you can see that it is now grayscaled. So it's just 240 by 320. We don't have the color channel anymore. So this effectively means that rather than having all of the other components to that, or all of the other color channels, we're not actually going to have that. Now, we can actually go and try to visualize this because right now we don't actually know what that frame looks like. So what we can do is we can actually go on ahead and install matplotlib. So pip install matplotlib. And we can actually try to visualize this. It looks like it's already installed. So we can run plot.imshow. And then pass through that state. Uh, oh, we haven't imported it. So from matplotlib, import pyplot as PLT and we'll clean up this code in a sec. I'm just getting it working. Okay, cool. So that is our image at the moment. Now you can see it looks kind of weird and bluish and that is because it is using an open CV color. So if we type in cv2.color, actually cv2.cvt color. And then we can type in uh, cv2.color. I wonder what we actually need to convert this to. What would it be? BGR to RGB. And we need to close that. Okay, there you go. So you can see that it is in fact gray at the moment. So we don't have a bluish tinge. We've actually gone and grayscaled our image. So we have now gone and successfully done that. Now, what I've gone and done there is I've just gone and imported matplotlib, which is a really great graphing library, which just makes it a little bit easier to actually visualize what's actually happening. Okay, so we've gone in grayscale. The next thing that we want to do is we want to get rid of this bottom buffer here. We don't actually want that. So we are just going to add in an extra step inside of our grayscale method to do that. Okay, so that is our frame now resized. 
So what I've gone and done is I've gone, actually, I don't think we've actually gone and cut off. I don't end up cutting this, the, the game frame off at the bottom here. So let's actually just go and test this out. I think that might be the next tutorial that I'm working on. Hold on. So let's actually take a look. Yeah, so we don't cut it off. We just uh, make it a little bit small. So we compress that frame down. So what I've gone and written is gray equals cv2.cv. Oh, the new lines that I've gone and written are resize equals cv2.resize. And then we're passing through our gray image and then we're just making it smaller. Sorry, my apologies. I thought we were going to be cutting off that game bar. You definitely could. Um, I, in order to preserve what I've actually gone and built here, I don't want to go and rip it out now. But what we've got is 160 comma 100. And then we've gone and specified interpolation equals cv2 dot intercubic. So this effectively resizes our image and scales it down. So we've got less pixels to process. So again, same sort of theory. So we could take the game bar off and that's going to effectively take out any um, extraneous information, which isn't adding value. In this case, I'm just making it a little bit smaller. And then what I've gone and written is state equals NP dot reshape. We're passing through this resize variable here and we're specifying it as 100 comma 160 comma 1. So if we go and run this now and create our new environment, you can see our shape is now 100 by 160 by 1. So this has effectively gone and cut down the number of pixels that we now need to process. You can see that we've still got our image down here. Okay, so now that that's done, so we can get rid of that, we can get rid of that, we can get rid of that, and we can get rid of that. And we've already got that matplotlib now installed. The one thing that we do need to fix now, though, is that we've actually got this shape here defined incorrectly inside of our observation space because we've actually gone and grayscaled and reshaped it. So we now need to reflect that change up here in this observation space up here. So we are going to change it to 100, 160, 1, which is effectively state dot shape 100 comma 160 comma 1 100 comma 160 comma 1 so that is our environment now effectively set up so i don't think we've got anything left to do let's actually take a look so we've gone oh we need to actually inherit from the base class so we can run a uh, super dot init inherit from env Uh, hold on. Wait, we don't need ENV here. Cool. All right, that's good. All right, so what we've gone and done, I just added a super. This is going to be inheriting from our ENV class. Okay, so we've gone and defined our init function that has a ton of stuff happening. So we're setting up our game. We're setting up our render logic. We're setting up or we're starting the game. We're creating our observation and our action space. We've then gone and defined our step function. So this defines how we actually take steps, how we do our pre-processing. We've gone, we haven't done anything on render because that's sort of handled by VizDoom itself. We've gone and defined our reset method. We've gone and defined our grayscale method and we've gone and defined our close. So now let's just kill off any VizDoom instances that we've got running so we can end that task and that task. Do we have any others? Nope, okay, cool. So if we go and run this, that is our environment now up and running here. And if we go and reset our instance, now if we go and take a step, so we can type in env.step1. Uh, so right now our monster is sort of to the left. So if we go and type in step zero, that's moving us to the left. Step zero to the left, step zero. Now if we go and shoot, pass through two, no, don't go to the left anymore. Boom. So it's gone and killed it, and the game episode is done. Then we can run emb.reset. Boom. New game. All right. So that is all up and working. We can now go and run emb.close. Okay. That is our game up and effectively running. Let's jump back over to Bob and have a chat. It's done, dude. Sweet, so what's next? Well, given that the model's now in a standard format, we can actually start building some models to play the game. Nice, yeah. so you gonna start basic or what? Yep, I think we'll kick off with the basic environment and then build up from there. So we got the game working, but now we gotta apply some AI. For this, we're going to be using reinforcement learning and specifically the PPO algorithm like we did in the Mario vid. 
but this time I'm going to explain it a little bit more. First, a quick refresher on reinforcement learning. RL has four key elements, agent, reward, environment, and action. The doom guy in this case is our agent. He can take some action, for example, shooting, moving left, moving right, and so on inside of the game environment. Then depending on the results of his action, he might get a reward. The AI controlling doom guy learns what actions to take inside of the environment in order to maximize that reward. Now, how exactly does this happen? The PPO algorithm is what allows us to perform reinforcement learning. It's built on top of an existing high performance algorithm called actor critic. In a nutshell, there are two neural networks inside a PPO, an actor, which controls our actions, and a critic, which tries to predict the future returns from the current state. So how does it work? Step one. First, we get an observation from our game. In this case, it's the current frame from Doom. Step two, that image is then passed to the actor and critic networks. The actor outputs a set of probabilities for which actions to take. This is referred to as the log probability. At the same time, the critic outputs the expected future returns from the current state. Think of this as a prediction of the sum of all of the rewards from here on out. This is referred to as the value. Step three, now that we've got a selected action, we can use it to make a move in our game. So our player moves and in return, we get the next frame from Doom. We also get the reward, whether the game is over and other game info. All of this information, the observation, reward, action, value, and log probabilities are then stored in a temporary buffer. Step four, this continues onwards until the game is done or we hit the max game length. This parameter is set by the algorithm. Once we've gone through the game and collected all the outputs, we can then train the actor and the critic to perform better. The outputs from one whole game or episode is called a trajectory. Step five, once we've got all this good data, we can get to training. First, we calculate the advantage our agent generated. This tells us how much better our agent performed than expected by the critic network. This is calculated as the discounted sum of rewards minus the discounted value from the critic network. Now you're probably thinking, why do we calculate this? Well, if the agent performed better than expected, we want to incentivize it to take the same action again and vice versa if it performed worse. So. We define the loss to include the probability of taking that action multiplied by the advantage. This means that if the probability was low and it generated a positive advantage, the probability of that action will increase after applying gradient descent. The full PPO loss function isn't just the probability multiplied by the advantage. It actually uses a clipping parameter and the ratio of the current probability versus the probability from the old agent to stabilize learning. I've simplified it a bit here to make it easier to understand. Step six, now that we've trained the actor, we can train the critic to better predict future rewards based on the state and action. The loss here is defined as the mean squared error between the discounted actual rewards and the predicted returns. A lower number here indicates that the model is performing better and that it is able to better predict future returns. That's one full training loop. The buffer is then cleared, a new game is played, and the training loop is run again. Ideally, with the goal to increase the probability of taking actions that create the highest possible total reward for the entirety of the game. That's how our little old agent learns. So we've got the majority of the hard bit now done. We've got VizDoom installed, we've actually gone and visualized it, we've actually gone and created our OpenAI gym framework, now what we can actually get onto doing is the good bit. So actually training our deep reinforcement learning model to be able to use it. Now I just realized I deleted a section from this. So this should actually be section three, uh, view environment, view state. Cool. All right. So the next thing that we're actually going to go on ahead and do is set up our callback. Now this callback is purely optional, but it effectively means that you're going to be able to save the reinforcement learning model as you're going through and training. So you don't need to manually go and save it. And it also means that if anything goes wrong, you've actually got different versions of the model saved at different states of training. So first things first, what we need to go on ahead and do is install a couple of things. Now, the first thing that we need to install is PyTorch. So to install PyTorch, we can just go to pytorch.org and then hit install. And then if you scroll in down, we are going to be using the stable build for Windows. We're going to be installing it via pip, Python, and we're going to be using CUDA 11.3. So if I copy that, now again, if you're using a different environment, Mac or Linux or Conda or LibTorch or one of these others, you just need to select your, the different options that you want and you're going to have the command down there. So I'm going to choose stable, Windows, pip, and then Python, CUDA 11.3. So if I copy that, jump back over into our notebook, 
and then drop the three. And if I run that command, that's going to go on ahead and install PyTorch, which I've already got installed here. So we are now good to go. Now, the next thing that we need to do is actually go on ahead and install stable baselines. So stable baselines is the framework that allows us to use the algorithms like PPO and all of the other cool stuff that uh, happens or all the other cool algorithms available for reinforcement learning. To install this, we just need to run this command here. So pip install stable dash baselines three and then inside of square brackets extra. Now, again, I'm going to include this documentation inside the description below if you want to check it out. But for now, just know that that's the pip command you got to run. So if we copy that, exclamation mark, paste that in and run that, that will install stable baseline. So that means we are now, doesn't look, let's check. So we're just getting that pip warning again. That's perfectly fine. Don't worry about that. All right, so we've gone and installed PyTorch. We've now gone and installed the stable baseline. So the stable baseline's line is exclamation mark pip install stable dash baselines three. And then inside of square brackets, we've got extra. Okay, so what else do we need for this callback? First up, we need to import some dependencies. So let's go on ahead and do that. Okay, that is, uh, I don't know what's happened there. That's kind of weird. That is our, or those are the two dependencies that we need now imported. So we've gone and written two lines of code there. The first one is import OS. So this is just importing the operating system module for Python, which just makes it easier to navigate through different folder structures and save stuff. It's going to be important when we actually go to save our different models. And then we've gone and imported the base callback class. So from stable underscore baselines three dot common dot callbacks import base callback. Now, rather than writing this callback from scratch, I'm just going to be copying it from the Mario tutorial. And again, this is the, the stock standard train and logging callback that I tend to use. So we've got that now set up, but to that, we need to pass through how frequently we want to save our model and actually log and where we're going to be saving stuff. So let's go on ahead and define those two paths. Okay, so I've gone and defined my two different directories. So the first one is going to be my checkpoint directory, and this is where we're going to be saving our trained reinforcement learning models. So the reason, these should actually be the same, so dot forward slash. The reason that I've actually gone and created or save these inside a folder called train basic and log basic, I'll explain this in a sec, is we're actually going to be training different models in a, later on in the tutorial. So just bear in mind that uh, this is purely optional. You could change these directories to whatever you want, really. So what I've written is checkpoint underscore dr equals dot forward slash train forward slash train underscore basic. So this means that when we start up our training, it's going to create a folder called train. It's going to create a folder inside of that called train basic. And that's where all of our saved models are going to be loaded. Then I've created a new folder called log underscore dear, and I've set that equal to dot forward slash logs forward slash log basic. Cool. Now what we can do is we can create an instance of our train and logging callback. So let's do that. Okay, so that is our callback now instantiated. So I've written callback equals train and logging callback and then to that what i've done is i've passed through the check frequency to check underscore freq equal to ten thousand. so this basically means that after every ten thousand steps of actually training our model we're going to save a version of those pytorch weights for our reinforcement learning agent so this means that if we wanted to go and reload it from that point onwards we could definitely go and do that then I've gone and specified my save path. So save underscore path equals checkpoint dear. So that's that over there. Our log dear is going to be used in a sec when we go and create our agent. Okay. So that is our callback now done. So we've gone and installed PyTorch. We've gone and installed stable baselines. We have also gone and imported those dependencies. Gone and copied over our train and logging callback. Created our checkpoint directory and our log directory. And we've gone and set up our callback down here. Now, remember when we were creating our environment, I said that there was this environment checker that you can actually go and use. Let's move this down. This should be down here. 
there's an environment checker that you can actually go on ahead and use to see whether or not your environment is in the right format. Well, I found this super useful when I was actually testing this out. So let's go on ahead and try this out. So I'm just going to go back to section. What is this? Section two for a sec. And let's actually test out our environment checker. So this is actually coming from stable baseline. So we can actually import it or first up, we need to import it. Okay, that is our environment checker now imported. So I've written from stable underscore baselines three dot common import env checker. This is super useful, particularly when you're creating your own environments because it checks whether or not you've got a valid environment. Super, super useful. So in order to use this, we can just run env checker and then let's double check. So what do we need to do? We just need to pass through. Doesn't actually give us that greater documentation. We just need to pass through our environment to it. So let's create an environment. So env, uh, we don't need to render in this particular case. Oh, let's leave it. So it's the same. So that's our environment. To that, we can pass through that. Uh, module object is not callable. Ah, we actually need to run dot check env. And we've got some errors. All right, so let's have a look. So the info returned by step must be a Python dictionary. Okay, so we've actually got a valid error here. So this is telling us that... So this is telling us that what we actually need to do is we need to reformat our Python dictionary or the info that we're getting from our Python dictionary to be in a slightly different format. So we can actually do this if we go back into here. So rather than just returning back our baseline game variables, we can actually just grab the value from that and we can specify. So let's call this ammo for now. And then rather than just returning back the array, we're going to be grabbing the specific value and then info can be a dictionary. And we're going to call that ammo. And then to that, we're going to be passing through ammo. Let's try that now. We go and pass this. Okay. So we've got rid of that error. So this is really, really good, particularly when you're getting your environment set up, because it actually allows you to see whether or not you've got a valid environment to actually work with. So in this particular case, we already saw that we had that error there. So by quickly reshaping what our, or what info is actually returned from our environment, this is going to save us from a lot of heartache later, later on when it comes to training our actual model. Okay, so that is looking good. The Now the next thing that we need to do is actually go on ahead and train our model. So let's get started on that. Okay, so in this particular case, in order to go on ahead and train our model, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be using the PPO algorithm, which we talked a little bit about in the animation or the sort of breakdown of how this actually works. Now, what we need to do in order to do that is first up, import the PPO algorithm from stable baselines three. So let's do that. So we're going to import PPO for training. And to do that, it's pretty straightforward. So from stable baselines three, import PPO. Cool. Now, in order to keep things nice and neat, I'm just going to close down any environments that I've got currently running so we can end those tasks. And we're going to create a new environment. So EMV equals visdoom gym and we don't want to render so i'm going to set uh by default it's not going to render right let's double check our class yeah so render is false by default so we don't want to render because that's going to slow down our training so we're going to create a non-rendered environment and then we are actually going to go on ahead and create our and then we're actually going to create an instance of the ppo algorithm so we're going to call this model and we're going to specify PPO. And then first things first, we need to define what type of policy we're going to be using for our policy or what type of neural network we're going to be using for our policy. So we're going to specify CNN policy because we're passing through an image. We then need to pass through our, our environment. We also need to pass through our TensorBoard logging DR. So this is going to be where we're actually going to be logging out our information. So we are going to be logging that to our log directory out here. And then we, uh, we need to specify a couple of other parameters. So we're going to specify verbose equals one because this is going to give us information while training. We also need to specify our learning rate. So this is effectively how fast our algorithm is actually going to learn. So we're going to set that equal to 0 0.0001. Now you can play around with this in some certain circumstances. You could actually increase the learning rate. In other circumstances, you might want to decrease it to ensure that you're effectively 
actually going through and learning the right things. Now, the last thing that we need to do is set end steps. So let's just double check how many frames or what's the maximum number of frames that we have for our basic environments. If we go to YouTube, uh, VizDoom, and then inside of GitHub, VizDoom scenarios, if we go to basic, um okay so make episode finish after 300 actions so we've only got a maximum of 300 actions that we've got in here so we can set end steps to i don't know uh let's set it to 256 for now you could definitely increase this or decrease this i think good practice is to set it not to the entire length of the game but ideally somewhere pretty close uh we're going to set it to 256 in this particular case and this is effectively how many frames or steps that our agent is going to take and store in the buffer before it actually goes and runs through training of our actor and our critic. So that is what that parameter actually is there. Um, so it's either going to run until the episode is done or to that maximum level, which is 256. Okay, so that is that now specified. So if we go and run that, it doesn't look like we've got any errors. So it said using CUDA device, so it's going to be using my GPU wrapping it in a monitor wrapper so this means that we're going to be able to get i think episode rewards and episode lengths and we're also getting our dummy vectorized environment and it's transposing our image so these are just transformations that stable baseline three goes and applies so let's quickly go through this line again so i've written model equals ppo and then i've specified that we want to use a c and n policy because we're going to be passing through an image now remember that our ppo algorithm has an actor and a critic this basically means that it's going to be using a CNN or convolutional neural network type policy for each of those in order to go on ahead and train our agent. We're then passing through our environment, which is a non-rendered environment. So this means that it's going to train faster. We're specifying our TensorBoard log directory. So this is where all of our logs are going to be saved. We've specified verbose equals one. So this means that we're going to have some uh, information appearing as we're actually going to go on ahead and train. And I'll talk you through some of those in a little bit more detail. We're specifying our learning rate and we're setting that to 0 0.0001001. Yep. And then end steps, we've set that equal to 256. So this is effectively how many ticks or how many frames we're going to be storing or what is our maximum trajectory length for PPO. Okay, so that is all well and good. Now what we can actually go on ahead and do is actually train our model. So to do this, we can type in model.learn and pass through how many time steps we want to run for in total. So total time steps, we're going to set that to 100,000 for now. We could probably train for longer, but I think this, this environment isn't super complex, so the agent's actually able to learn it relatively quickly. And in order to ensure that we actually go and save our models, we need to pass through our callback, which we had down here. So we can run callback. We can set that equal to callback. And if we go and run this now, all things holding equal, this should effectively go on ahead and run. So this first bit is saying it's logging to dot forward slash logs, forward slash log basic, forward slash or backward slash PPO1. So if we go into it now, go to YouTube, VizDoom, logs we've got log basic we've got ppo1 so that file there is our tensorboard log file so that's going to allow us to monitor the training and the performance of our ppo algorithm as it's actually going through and training now what you would have also noticed is if we go in we've now got a folder called train train basic this is where all of our saved models are going to be saved as the algorithm actually goes through and trains our model now let's see, it looks like we've got an error. What's happened there? Into object does not support item assignment. Okay, let's actually read through this. All right, found the error. So what was happening was inside of the logic, inside of our game environment, what was happening is we just needed to do a couple of bits of tweaking to the info section. So let me actually control Z this. So rather than specifying or passing back, let me undo that. All right. So rather than passing back a dictionary here, what would happen if we actually had an error in our game state or we reached done, we'd be returning back an integer, which the stable baselines algorithm doesn't necessarily like. So what we need to do is just create a new dictionary. So info equals dictionary. And in this particular case, we're not actually going to be using this information. It's purely just a descriptor so we're going to set it equal to info and then info and so what i'm going to do 
is out of here we are either going to be returning this ammo value so let's just return that or zero so this will mean that we effectively return a dictionary regardless of whether we have a valid state or whether or not we have an invalid state um, but otherwise it was going to throw that error which says uh, you cannot assign a value to an integer it's going to throw an error so in this particular case this is going to be fine so we've changed it from displaying a uh so in this particular case if we didn't have an error in our game environment we would be returning a dictionary if we did have an error we'd be returning a integer which is not going to play nice so in this particular case this should effectively work let's run it through our environment checker again still no errors so that's one that apparently managed to get past our environment checker in this particular case but that's fine so let's just go on ahead and close down my bizdoom environments because i think i've got a ton z or should be z okay so it looks like they're fine okay let's go and kick off training again now so i'm going to clear this cell uh how do we clear this cell here we go clear outputs okay so let's go and create a new environment kick this off and then start training okay so now it's going to be logging out to ppo4 because i ran it twice to debug in this particular case it's going to be going to ppo4 now so if we go to ppo4 bizdoom logs log basic ppo4 it's now there cool but you can see that we're already starting to get some information back. So we are getting our episode length mean. So this means how many frames that our agent is able to survive on average or how long it is on average. We're getting our episode reward mean. So this is the total or the sum of total reward on average per episode. And then we also get back a whole bunch of additional information. So for once, I'm actually going to go into a little bit of detail for this here. So I've explained the length mean and the reward mean. So that's pretty straightforward. FPS, that's the frames per second, so effectively how fast our VizDoom environment is actually processing. The iterations, I don't actually know what this one is. I think that might be the number of episodes, but don't quote me on that. Time elapsed, so how long it's actually gone for. Total time steps is how many time steps our agent has actually seen, so how many frames it's actually processed. Okay, now to the good bit. So prox KL. So the way the PPO works is by looking at the previous agent and looking uh, looking at the previous probabilities from the old agent versus the new agent. So as it goes and trains through, it actually looks back at what it was predicting previously. Now, this is a measure of how different the current agent is from the old agent. If you see this spike massively, then it means that we have unstable learning. So ideally, this should vary and not be the same but it shouldn't spike because otherwise that means that we've got huge divergence and we, we have uh, effectively unstable training. Now, if we do have unstable training, the way the PPO works handles this is by using something called PPO clipping. So this means that if we've got a huge change, PPO clips that change so that it doesn't um, throw out our training a whole heap. This clip fraction tells us whether or not it was able to take the base ratio, so whether or not it was able to not have to clip and go on ahead and train versus the amount of times it did have to clip. So right now it looks like it had to clip 13.9% of the time. This tells us the range that it has to clip, so how much it's actually going to clip by if it needs to clip. Uh, entropy loss, I didn't actually go into this one into too much detail because what I actually found is that that is particularly important if you've got shared weights, but there's more important metrics to pay attention to here. Explained variance is a measure of how well our critic model is able to explain the variance in our value function. So ideally you want this to be positive because that means that our critic model is able to predict the value of the current state in a lot more detail. Learning rate, that is just a hyperparameter so we can set that. Clip rate is a hyperparameter as well so these aren't going to fluctuate, they're set unless you use a schedule. Um, loss, again, this one isn't as important as these two down here. Um, so N updates is how many updates we've actually gone and made to our actor and critic policy networks or add actor and critic networks. All right, policy gradient loss. This one is super important. So this one tells us how well our agent is able to take actions to capitalize on its advantage. Ideally, you want to see this decrease, which means that the loss is decreasing, which means our agent is able to better capitalize on advantage value loss tells us how well our agent is actually able 
to predict the current return based on the current state in action. So again, you want this one to decrease. Now, what you're going to notice is that the act, the policy gradient loss is going to fluctuate quite a fair bit in the start, and then it's eventually going to head down. So let's actually take a look at what these look like when we plot them out. When we plot them out. So I'm just going to open up a new terminal and I'm going to go to that log directory, which at the moment is inside of PPO4. So let's go to it. So CD, I'm going to go into my YouTube directory and then go into VizDoom, which is in folder 26 dash 05. And then I'm going to activate my environment. Don't worry if you don't have this, just go straight into your logs, um, VizDoom, and then uh, scripts activate. Then we're going to go into our logs directory, which is here. And then we are going to go into our log basic folder, which is there. Remember we defined this. And then we're going to go into our PPO4 folder, which is there. And then we're going to start our TensorBoard um, logging capability. So to do that, we just type in TensorBoard dash dash log dear equals dot. So the full command, let me move that over here so you can see it. So the full command is TensorBoard dash dash log dear equals dot. And that assumes you're in the current folder where your uh, model is actually logging out to. So if I go and run that now, this should start up TensorBoard. Cool, so if you get this warning, that's fine. It just means that you don't have TensorFlow installed in your current environment. You're still at least able to be able to log out. So if I go to, it'll also tell you where it's gonna start up the server. So here it is running at HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost colon 6006. So if we go to there, we get our logs. So let me zoom out a bit. Okay, so what this is telling us is that we are, uh, so our length is increasing. So this means that we're living for longer. Our reward mean is dropping. So that means that our, we are not capitalizing on reward, which is a little bit strange and probably not so great. If we go and take a look at our model, our explained variance is going up, our value is going down, our policy gradient is looking a little bit low at the moment. So we will let that train for a little bit longer. Ideally, you want the explained variance to keep going upwards. You want your value loss to near zero a little bit more. So right now we can see that down there, it's looking like it's the value is the number to pay attention to here is 2084. What's our policy gradient loss at the moment? So right now it's looking like it's pretty low, but that is not all that great. So we'll let that run for a little bit longer. And ideally what we should do is we should see these metrics um, eventually sort of stabilize. So our value loss should eventually trend back towards zero. Policy gradient loss should spike up a little bit more and then trend back down to zero. But if you hit refresh up here, you'll actually be able to see what the performance is like over time. This isn't looking so good at the moment, so we might need to do a little bit of additional training. But for now, let's let that run and then we'll see what that looks like. A few minutes later. Alrighty, so at the moment, I haven't stopped training yet, but it doesn't look like this is actually performing all that well. If you start to see policy gradient loss going to almost zero really, really quickly, that's an indicator that your model isn't actually learning all that well. And it's effectively just taking the same action every single time. This is also integrated by this approx KL function here as well, which basically means that there's no divergence from the previous policy to the current policy. So this means that it looks like we've got some a couple of issues here. So what we can actually try to do is I'm actually going to stop this training. So just by hitting stop, it looks like that is completely finished. Yeah, no, this isn't actually improving. So we should see this episode reward mean start to trend upwards rather than just go straight downwards. What I'm going to try to do is let's actually change the number of steps that we're actually going to take. So let's bump this up significantly. So the other parameter that, that I actually tried previously was significantly higher. And I wonder whether or not that 300 uh, ticks represents the number of frames or whether or not there's multiple frames per tick. So let's actually change that. So I'm going to set that to 2048, create a new model, and then we're going to start learning again. So this is now logging to PPO5. So down here, and this is a pretty common process, guys. So when you're training these models, they can be, be very finicky. And sometimes you do need to change hyperparameters to effectively get better training. But this is an indicator that this isn't performing well. You shouldn't see episode reward mean just tank and stabilize there. It should effectively fluctuate a little bit. Um, and you definitely shouldn't be seeing this. So policy gradient loss, let me move my head so you can see it. Policy gradient loss should not be trending towards zero. Bad indicator. That looks like it's not performing well. So let's go into 
sorry, opening up random stuff. Let's go back in now. So I'm going to go back out of PPO4. I'm going to go into PPO5. Let's see what that looks like. So that's just an indicator really on that you can see that these models aren't actually performing well. Okay, so this is only going to give us some information back once it's started training. So once we get that first little block of info coming back from our model.learn function, we'll have an idea of how this is actually performing. This is way too small. Okay, so that's started. So we should get our first log out of here. Cool. All right, let's give that a sec and then we'll come back and we'll take a look at our logs. Okay, that's at least our first log now displayed. So we've got, um, how's this looking? So explain variance looking like it's trending towards zero, which is okay for now because that's going to increase over time. That makes sense. KL, so that looks like 0 0.0 for ETH. So there is at least some variance between the current policy and the previous policy. Um, policy gradient loss, that looks okay. Value loss is pretty high as well. So if we go and refresh this, So that's fine if our episode reward mean goes down, as long as it doesn't just go down and keep going down. It should fluctuate a little bit. So let's wait for another log to come out and we'll see how that's going. Okay, that is looking much better now. So we can see that our episode reward mean is increasing. So rather than having 75.6 and just tanking downwards, we are now at least heading towards positive. So if we go and refresh this, you can see that that is looking better already. So even though our episode length mean has decreased, that is perfectly okay. We actually expect the length of the episode to decrease because our agent is able to more closely go st head straight to that monster and shoot him down. And we can see that our episode reward mean is increasing now, which is another much better sign. So in this particular case, increasing that end steps hyperparameter gives our agent a slightly larger buffer to learn, which means that we're not going to head straight down towards zero for our policy loss. So this is looking better already. So we're going to give this a little bit of time, let this train, and then we'll come back to this and I'll walk you through it and we'll see how our model is actually performing. And then we'll uh, jump back over to Bob and see how that goes. A little longer than a few minutes later. Alrighty, so increasing the number of steps that we run our agent for was a great move. So you can see now that we have significantly better performance. Now you're probably thinking, Nick, you're just showing me a bunch of graphs. What the hell does this mean? Well, let me walk you through it. Okay, so the most important graphs or the two most important plots here are these two. So the first one, this is the episode length mean. This is how long on average every single game took. Now, the faster the game in this particular case means effectively how long our agent has taken to complete that level. Now, this might either mean that the agent has either died really quickly or it's actually completed the level really, really quickly. Sometimes it takes some visual analysis to actually see what this actually looks like. But one good indicator that we actually have good in performance in this particular case is that we have our episode reward mean that has increased significantly. So you can see over here that our episode reward mean has hit a average of about 85.89. So you can see that in that value metric. So if you look at value down there, we've got 85.89. That is a really good score in this particular case because the maximum score that we can get is 101. And that, that can only effectively be achieved if the monster is right in front of you and you've actually hit it the first time. Um, so in this particular case, that look is looking pretty good. It looks like we have had some divergence and now our agent or now the existing or the current policy is pretty close to the latest policy. So our approx KL is reduced. So remember, this is a metric of how different our old policy is from or how different our new policy is from the old policy. So you want to see this increase and then come back down. But if it increases too much, then it's going to get clipped. So you can see that that clip fraction is increasing up there. Our explained variance, why won't this move? Our explained variance has got up high. So right now it is at 77.38, which is a good, good sign. It means that our critic is able to accurately or closer to accurately predict what the future sum of returns is going to be given the current state in action. And you can see that that value loss has decreased. So this is a good sign. Um, policy gradient is sort of fluctuated and you can see that it's increased as our value losses decrease. And this is effectively because as our critic is better able to predict its 
this counter future sum of rewards, the ability to determine advantage is decreasing. So this means that this might increase a little bit whilst this decreases. But the fact that our episode reward mean has increased is a really, really good sign. So that is effectively our agent now trained. Now, another thing that I wanted to show you is that because we've now gone and finished training, I've actually stopped this a little bit early, by the way. So if I actually go in and show you, we've gone up to 51,200 time steps. So I didn't need to go all the way to the end. 51,200 got us to an episode reward mean of 85.9 and explained variance of 0.774, a value loss of 38.4, which is a mean squared error, which is very, very tight or a very tight tolerance uh, and a policy gradient loss of 0 0.176, which is looking pretty good as well. Now... What I wanted to show you is that we should effectively have our trained agents in here. So these are our historical trained policies. So in this particular case, we are good to go. Let's jump back over to Bob and see what he thinks. So the model's trained and tuned, Bob. You wanna check it out? Yeah, let's see it. All right, so I'm actually gonna show it to you at different stages of the process and show you how and what it's learned. Cool? Cool. Alrighty, now as expected, Bob wasn't going to let us get off the hook by just saying the model is trained. He wanted to see how that model actually performs. So let me actually show you how to do this and we'll actually be able to test it out. So the first thing that we need to do is the, or the first thing that we want to be able to do is have the capability to reload a model from our disk. So we can do this using model.load. So if I type in model.load or we could even go ppo.load. So let's do ppo.load. So I'm going to create a new instance. I'm going to say model equals ppo.load. And then we just need to pass through where our current model is currently stored. So in this particular case, it's in train, train basic and over here. So we just need to reload that. So dot forward slash dot forward slash train, train basic. And then the name of our latest saved model is best underscore model 70,000. So that is our model loaded. Now what we can also do is we can import a function that allows us to test and evaluate our model. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So let's first up go and import this evaluate uh, model function and then we'll actually be able to test it out. Okay, so that is our evaluate policy method now brought in. So I've written from stable underscore baselines three dot common dot evaluation import evaluate underscore policy. So this will allow us to actually test out our model. So let's actually go on ahead and test this out. Now, rather than doing it non-visually, let's actually render it. So let's create a new environment. So I'm going to type in env equals uh, visdoom gym, and then we're going to set render equal to true. So that's our environment we can now use. We can now store our mean reward, comma, underscore equals, and set that equal to evaluate policy. So this is effectively how we can use the evaluate policy method. So to that, we pass through model, the environment, and then the how many times we want to evaluate. So we're going to run it for 10 games. Okay, so let's take a look at what we've done there. So first up, we've gone and reloaded our model using ppo.load. So I've written model equals ppo.load. And then I've passed through the full file path to that model that we want to re reload. So let's add a comment, reload model from disk. Then we've gone and created a rendered environment. Then we're going to go on ahead and use the evaluate policy method to actually test this out. So evaluate mean reward for 10 games. And to do that, I've created two variables that we're going to unpack. So mean underscore reward comma underscore equals evaluate underscore policy. And then to that, we'll pass through uh, two positional arguments. So model and the environment. So this and this, and then we we'll specified how many games we want to evaluate our policy for. So if we go and test this out now, let's minimize all this stuff. Let's close any instances of doom that we've already got running. So that's our environment now up in there. Now, all right, cross your fingers, guys. Let's see how this actually performs. All right, you can see it literally just smashed through that. So that was actually 10 games. But you saw how fast it was actually moving towards and actually killing that agent. Now, let's actually run it for 100 games rather than just 10. So, if, so you can see it's moving, it's killing that agent. Let me make this a bit bigger. 
Like it is literally moving so fast you can't actually see it. It is shooting the, the, the monster in this particular case. So let's take a look at our main reward. 86.72 so you saw how fast that was actually going so that is how to actually run it using the evaluate policy method now we can also do it inside of a loop so let's do it using that method as well Okay, so that's the loop that we can use to run to actually test out our agent without actually just using the evaluate policy function. So let me walk you through this. So we're going to loop through each game. And in this case, we're going to be playing five games. So four episode in range five. So this is just going to be incrementing one, two, three, four, five. And then we are going to first up reset our environment. So we're going to run emv.reset and store the game frame inside of a variable called OBS for observations. We're then going to set a parameter done equal to false. So this is going to state that we haven't actually completed the episode as of yet. And then we're going to run while not done. So while our episode isn't finished, we're going to use our model to predict what action to take. So model.predict, and then by passing through our observation, we're going to get our action back. So either one, two, or three. So once we've got that action, we can then go and take that and pass it to our env.step method. And out of that, we're going to get our observation and reward whether or not we're done and any info. We're then going to use time.sleep to take a little bit of a break. So this loop is very similar to what we did right at the start. So once we've gone and slept for, uh, what is that, 0 0.05 of a second, we're then going to accumulate our total reward. So we can see what our total reward is. We'll print it out. So I've just got a print string method or print formatting method here. And then we're going to sleep between each game for two seconds. So you can actually see what that performance is like. So if we go and run this now, uh, what do we do? So time.sleep. We've got an error there. Uh, we need another set of brackets there. What's happened? A uh, number of dimensions larger than one. What are we getting back from? So if we run model.predict OBS, so we get this first value, which should be our actual action. So let's unpack that. So all right, let's try that. Nope, still got an error. Total reward is not defined. Okay, so we need to instantiate our total reward. Set that equal to zero. You can see it. It's heading towards the monster every single time. Boom. It did boom. So you can see that it is actually moving toward... Let's actually slow it down even more. So let's give it um, 0.25. So because the, the monster is like pretty much directly in front of our agent, it doesn't actually need to move all that fast. So there it's moving, shot. So you can see how much better this agent is performing versus the random one. Now let's quickly take a look at each one of the different stages of how this model performs. So we're going to jump over to a montage and I'm going to show you it at 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000, and you've already seen 70,000. So let's jump over to that. But that in a nutshell is how to train your reinforcement learning agent to be able to play Doom. After this, we're going to go back and have a chat to Bob. All right, so first up's the model trained on the basic environment for 10,000 steps. At this stage, it's still pretty crap and still pretty random. 10,000 steps later, this brings us to our next model, and you can see the Doom guy is now at least shooting. Still pretty inaccurate at this stage, but at least he's progressing and getting a little bit better. What do you know? He also manages to score a kill towards the latter stages of this episode. Still, I think pretty random at this stage.
40,000 steps. Here's where things really start to shake up. You can see the Doom guys progressively getting closer towards the monster each and every time. Still not super accurate at this stage, but definitely getting better. And 50,000 steps. Here's where Doom Guys really started to lift his game. He's progressively heading towards the monster each and every time, and you can really start to see that the reinforcement learning model has started to do its work and has started to converge towards an optimal solution. I threw 60k steps in here as well. This isn't necessarily all that much better than the 50k model, but you can start to see that the model starts to really fine tune as it gets towards an optimal solution and isn't necessarily going to get that much better once it's achieved its goal. And just for shits and gigs, I figured I'd throw in a full speed run as well. This sort of shows just how fast this model is able to process and run through the environment. And that's our basic model now all done and dusted. Hey Nick, do you think you could train the AI to play other levels? Sure can, although it kind of depends on the complexity of the environment. Right. Going super complex from the get-go can be pretty difficult for the agent to learn. There are a bunch of techniques that we can actually use to beat that though. For now, what do you say we try a slightly harder environment? One where the monsters actually fight back. Yeah, cool. Alrighty, so now what we gotta do is play some other levels. This is pretty easy in this case because we've already set up the open AI gym environment. All we have to do is change the game configuration file and update the actions that are available. We should then be able to use the same training flow to go on ahead and train our model. Alrighty, so Bob was pretty impressed, but uh, to his point, it was a relatively simple environment. So there wasn't a ton of stuff that the agent had to do. It just had to move to the monster, shoot it, and then it was sort of done. Now we can make this a slight bit harder. So rather than just training on the basic environment, remember right at the start, what we took a look at were all the other different environments that we had available. So if we go back in and we take a look at our GitHub repository, VizDoom, and then scenarios, we had all these others. So we've got basic, deadly corridor, deathmatch, defend the line, defend the center, health gathering, so on and so forth. So if we actually take a look, the next one that we're actually going to take a crack at is defend the center. So this is a, let me actually just read out the scenario. So the purpose of this scenario is to teach the agent that killing the monsters is good. And when the monsters kill you, that's bad. In addition, wasting ammunition is not very good either. Agent is rewarded only for killing monsters so that he has to figure out the rest for himself. The map is a large circle. Player is spawned in the exact center. There's five melee only. Monsters are spawned along the wall. Uh, they're killed after a single shot and after dying each monster is respawned after some time the episode ends when the player dies now it is inevitable because of the limited ammo so we get one reward for killing a monster we've got three available buttons turn left turn right and shoot so the same buttons that we had when we were going and <clears throat> training our current model so all that we really need to do here is we just need to change the map that we're using. So this is relatively straightforward. So what we can do is save this. And what I'm gonna do is, let's just refresh that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to make a copy of this basic environment. So we can save that one. And we are going to, which one are we in now? So that's the copy. And what we're gonna do is let's rename this first up. So we're gonna rename this Defend Center. Rename, oh my God, rename, there we go. I'm gonna call this Defend Center. Good name or whatever you want, not purely optional. Okay, so what we have, so we've got our basic tutorial, we've got our Defend Center tutorial now, or we've got our Defend Center notebook. So what we can do is import VizDoom as per usual, all we really need to do is change what game config we load up. So we want defend center. So that is this one here. Let me zoom in so you can see it. All right, defend the center. So we can grab that and replace that over here. So inside of the game.load load config method. So now let's close down 
uh, viz doom. We don't need that. We can end that task. So if we go and run this now, you can see completely different game environment, right? This is completely different to what we had previously before we had the slightly different environment and it's a different shape as well. So keep that in mind. Now, what we can do is we can go and run this action. This is going to do something. We get can get our state. We can get game variables, so on and so forth. What we can go on ahead and do is run our loop as we did before and see how that actually performs. We can see that our agent is able to shoot. We've got monsters coming at him. And eventually he'll die. Because he runs out of ammo and there's just people coming at him. And he's right now he's not shooting anyone all that effectively, right? So we want to be able to train our agent in this particular case to shoot all the different monsters that are coming at him. Okay, so you sort of get the idea of how this is actually going to play out, right? So that is our new map now loaded. Let me expand that again. Don't know why I closed that one. But we don't need that. So what we want to do first up is get this into a same, similar shape to what we had inside of our VizDoom basic environment. Because right now you can see that the shape of the actual game is significantly larger. This is just because of the parameters that we've got inside of our configuration. So what we can actually do is we can actually fix that. So let's actually close this. I'm just going to close VizDoom and we are going to reshape this. So if we go into YouTube and then do, 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 where is it? VizDoom, GitHub, VizDoom. And if we go into our scenarios, let's open up our basic one. I'm just going to zoom out of this a little bit. And let's open up our, what are we doing? We're doing defend the center. Okay. So here's where we're going to do a little bit of magic. So right now, the screen resolution, you can see it's definitely different, right? So over here, our line 12 for our basic environment, we've got a screen resolution of 320 pixels by 240 pixels. We're actually going to copy that over and use that for defend the center as well. So that means we're going to have frames of the exact same size. So rather than having a significant larger or different shaped game observation coming back. We're going to have the same game observation coming back now. So all I've done is I've copied this. So the screen resolution parameter from the basic.config and I've pasted it over to here. So the screen resolution is the same for defend the center. Now, if we go and create our environment. So let's go and start it up again. So if we go and load this, you can see it's already much smaller. And this is more like what we had previously. So rather than having the huge frame, we've got it cut down. So now if we go and run it, you can see it's just a much smaller game environment. Which if you wanted to train on a larger game environment, it's perfectly fine. You could definitely go and do that and just resize the frame. But it just makes it a lot faster when it comes to actually processing your game. So right now, we're pretty good. This is going to be how we actually go and train our model. Now, the cool thing is that we've pretty much already got the workflow now set up. I'm just going to close this frame down we've pretty much already got the, the the framework set up to go on ahead and train this the only thing that we need to do is copy this scroll on down and paste it over here and this is in our viz doom gym class so we don't need to do very much else we just need to paste it into there and we should kind of be good to go let's just double check our buttons so remember we've got we had three buttons configured in the previous environment. Let's just double check it is still the same case inside of this scenario. Uh, what are we doing? Defend the center. Yep, we've got three buttons. So turn left, turn right, attack. We've now got two game variables. So we've got ammo and we've also got health. We're not going to do too much with those for now. So that's perfectly fine. Okay, so we can save this. And if we go and run at this VizDoom environment, uh, what's happened? All right, we've got to go and import our dependencies. So let's run that. That's perfectly fine. We don't have a game running at the moment, so we can delete that. Okay, so that looks fine. So we, all we've gone and done is we've gone and changed. Let me zoom out so you can see it. All we've gone and done is we've gone and changed this line here. So this is going to give us a different environment or it's going to load up a different config when we actually go and instantiate our viz doom gym environment now you could actually set this up so that it's a parameter inside of your class perfectly fine okay that is working let's go and test it out that starts up we reset let's view our game state inside of matplotlib let's not delete it yet so if we go and import our environment checker 
Looks like we've got no issues there. You go to matplotlib. Got no issues there either. Cool. This looks like it's all ready to go. So we can actually close down this environment. So env.close. And then let's go through our stable baselines walkthrough. So we're going to set up our callback. And this time, rather than saving it inside of our train basic folder, we're going to save it in a slightly different folder. So let's call it uh, train defend and log defend. So this basically means we are going to overwrite the models that we've trained for our basic agent. We're going to have it inside of a separate folder. If we're going to set up these new checkpoint directories and log directories, set up our callback by running that line. So we're going to run this import. We're going to set up our new instance. And remember, we're going to have a non-rendered environment when we're going to go train because it's going to train a whole heap faster. So we set that up. And this time, should we increase n steps? Yeah, so because this environment is slightly more complex, let's give it a bit more time to actually learn about the environment. So we're going to increase this from 2048 to 4096. And we're going to leave our learning rate the same for now. So we don't need, we shouldn't need to change that. So let's actually start up with those parameters. If you've got a really complex environment or a long running environment, so say you're tried and trained for Dota or something or CSGO, you'd be increasing that n steps parameter pretty significantly and probably dropping the learning rate as well so that it learns um, a little bit slower. So there's so many nuances in those games. So you're going to give it need to give it time to actually learn. Okay, but in that particular case, that is fine. It doesn't look like we've got any errors there. We're also going to need to train for significantly longer. So right now we've got it set to 100,000. Is that going to be enough? Let's leave it at 100,000 for now. And then we'll see how performance actually looks like. So if we go and run this, you can see it's logging to logs, log defend PPO1. If we go and take a look at our logs, D, YouTube, uh, where are we? Vizdoom, logs, log defend now. So we've got a PPO1 folder. So let's go and start up TensorBoard in that folder. So I'm going to cancel this. So I'm going to stop the server. I'm going to go out of this. Let me just bring this up. So I'm going to go out of logs basic. I'm going to go into logs defend. So that's CD log defend. So that's going to go into that folder. And then I can go into CD PPO1, which is going to be our latest logging file. And then start up TensorBoard against TensorBoard. Dash dash log dir equals dot. So that's running. And if we go and refresh TensorBoard, how we looking here? Nothing run yet. Okay, so this might take a little bit of time because it's going through and learning that particular environment and running through each one of those steps or each one of those game frames. So this might take a little bit of time for you to get your first uh, result from stable baseline. So let's give that a sec and then we'll be able to see model performance. Moments later. Okay, so this is model performance as it's training. So we can see that right now after, I don't know, let's take a look. After about 24,576 time steps, we have an episode reward mean of 3.03 .03, and an average episode length of about 108 episodes or frames in this particular case. So we are looking pretty good. So we can see that we've got an upward trend. Our episode length mean is increasing, which is a good sign in this particular case, right? Because we want to last as long as possible versus the previous scenario where the only goal was to shoot the monster. Here we want our agent to be able to last for as long as possible and try to shoot down as many monsters as possible. I mean, we know that eventually he's going to die because he's got a fixed amount of ammo, but that is still perfectly okay. So in this particular case, we want to see both of these increase for this game. Uh, we can see that our agent or our current policy is diverging from the historical one, which is okay. We're still clipping a little bit. Perfectly fine. Uh, our explained variants, these things don't go down. Go away. How do we refresh this? So our explained variance is increasing. So this means that our critic is getting better at predicting the future sum of returns. We also have our policy gradient loss decreasing and our value loss increasing as well. So this means that it's probably finding advantage and it's being able to capitalize that by increasing the probability of taking those actions which are doing so. So we want to see this keep increasing to as high as possible and we want to see this keep increasing as high as possible but we'll let that train and then we'll come back and take a look before we go back to bob with our montage five minutes later okay that is the model finished training so you can see we've gone for the full 
100,000 total time steps, so you can see that there. So our final episode length was about 189 steps. We had an average episode reward of about 10.7. Uh, frames per second was about 53. Whole bunch of other information here. If we take a look at the TensorFlow log, so you can see that the length definitely increased upwards, and we eventually ended up with a pretty good model, or at least I think based on these metrics. Um, our reward mean increased. Uh, we were getting some divergence between the old and the new policies. Uh, what else? Explained variance was hitting 93.2. So this means that our critic definitely understood the variances in how we were generating rewards or was accurately able to predict what our returns were likely to be based on the current game observation and action. So again, if we wanted to go on ahead and try these out, we definitely can. So we can run our evaluate policy method. Um, and let's import our 50,000 model, for example, in this particular case, because we'll save the 100,000 for the montage. So let's go on ahead. What we now need to do is import the train defend model, though. So it's not basic anymore. So if we load that, create our environment, go on ahead and test it out. So you can see it's already performing way better. It's actively shooting agents, shooting monsters. Look at that. Insane. Not too bad, right? So again, if we wanted to go and test this out, we can go on ahead and stop it in this case because you sort of get the idea. Um, we can go and run it using this framework, which slows it down a little bit. But you can see it's still kind of wasting ammo on stuff that might not potentially be there. Like that was a wasted shot. That's a wasted shot. That's a wasted shot. So it could definitely still be better. You can definitely see it's performing significantly better than our baseline agent. All right, let's take a look at our montage. So now we're taking a look at the model trained for the defend environment for about 10k steps. So it looks like he just killed one of the pink monsters and he's randomly sort of shooting around. Not all too accurate at this stage, but as we progress we'll definitely see some improvement and as you can see all the monsters are running towards him now and you'll start to see health drop off pretty rapidly and the game will end And now we have the model trained for 20k steps. Looks like he's scoring a couple of hits pretty early on. You can see he's starting to accurately identify that he needs to be shooting the enemies. Oh, he's got that guy there. Progressively getting a little bit better. As you're starting to see these red flashes, what's basically happening is he's losing health quite rapidly. Now, because he's got a fixed amount of ammo, that will eventually be his demise. Fifty k steps. Early shot. Looks like he's managed to take out that dude, and you can see he's definitely way more accurate now. He's progressively taking out enemies. He's spinning around, so he's at least got a little bit of a strategy to actually go out and win. And as I said, that he just starts randomly shooting at stuff. But look at this! Bang, bang, actively taking them out. So you can see that he's definitely progressed from our initial ten k model. Now we'll let this run and see how he eventually performs.
80k steps and my dude is a terminator you can see he's actively taking out enemies spinning around has lost zero percent health as that pink monster is heading towards him he's taking him out so you can see that this reinforcement learning agent has learned quite a fair bit about what is actually influencing the reward in this particular case taking out the monsters before they start to degrade your health i think in this particular episode doom guy actually manages to go all the way to the end and the only thing which eventually catches him up is the fact that he runs out of bullets so he can't actually defend himself anymore you can see he's actively spinning around taking out different enemies And yeah, this is 100k step. So again, not a huge improvement over 80k, but definitely has managed to converge to an optimal solution. Our reinforcement learning agent has learned that it needs to be taking out the monsters in order to win. And yet again, here's a full speed run, just so you can see how quick this is actually running. So, thoughts? Yeah, that was awesome, but Doom Guy kept dying at the end. That's kind of inevitable in this case. He's got a fixed amount of ammo, so eventually the monsters are gonna get him. Ah. Got it. You mentioned before that there was some stuff that you could do to train agents to play harder games. You got any examples of that? Well, there's two techniques that I found work pretty well. The first one is reward shaping, which sort of helps ease the sparse reward problem. Let me give you an example of this. Now, imagine you need to navigate through a maze and you only get a reward once you finish. Well, the agent is going to find it tough to learn how to navigate through without constant feedback. One way we can help this though is to use reward shaping. So rather than giving just a reward for getting to the end of the maze, we can provide incremental feedback and incremental reward for completing sub goals. For in this case, just getting closer to the end of the maze, not just completing. The second technique that we can use is something called curriculum learning. This is where we train the agent in an easier environment and then progressively increase the complexity and or difficulty so the agent learns to play in a real world scenario. For Doom, we can set this using the difficulty setting in the game config. Nice. Now, not to be pushy, but are you gonna give it a go? <laughs> yeah, all right, let's do it. First things first, the sparse reward problem. I talked a little bit about the maze example, but how does this apply to Doom? Well, the next problem that we're going to be taking a look at is the deadly corridor level. In this level, the agent needs to get to the end of the corridor to get some armor. If he does this, then he gets a thousand points as a reward. He also gets a point for every step he takes towards the armor, which reflects an additional potential 1,312 possible points. The problem is that without shooting the monsters in the corridor first, he'll die before he gets anywhere near close to the armor. The reward function doesn't take this into account and in some senses has sparse rewards for this part of the problem function. So how do we solve this? Well, first things first, we can use reward shaping to incentivize our agent to kill the monsters. We can add rewards for killing each monster, preserving our own health, and having accurate shots. Second, we can use curriculum learning to help the agent learn. Rather than making the monsters hyper-aggressive, we can make them a little bit softer. This means that the agent will have a chance to kill some monsters and learn that this yields a positive reward. Once it's running along the right trajectory, we can increase the difficulty and keep training. This should hopefully be enough to teach our agent to play. Alrighty. We're in the end game now. So Bob's asked us how we might go about dealing with harder environments. There's two key things that we can do to effectively deal with harder environments that our agent is struggling to learn in. These are through reward shaping and the other one that I found most effective is curriculum learning. Now, in order to do this, we actually need a harder environment because so far we've smashed through basic and we've smashed through defense center. So where is our difficult environment? Well, the one that we're actually gonna be using 
is called deadly corridor. So the purpose of this scenario is to teach the agent to navigate towards his fundamental goal, the vest, and make sure he survives at the same time. The map is a corridor with shooting monsters on both sides. A green vest is placed at the opposite end of the corridor. The reward is proportional, negative or positive to the change in distance. If you get closer to the vest, you get more points. If you don't get closer to it, you get less points. So if you get close to it, that's going to be a good thing. Now, if the player ignores monsters on the sides and runs straight for the vest, he'll be killed somewhere along the way. Um, now, the way that they ensure this or they enforce this is by setting the, the monster skill really high, which is this doom skill equal to five. Now, we can actually tweak that to make our environment a little bit easier. So that is how we're going to go on ahead and perform curriculum learning, which is that increasing type difficulty. Um, so what are some other penalties? So we've got five available buttons. So left turn, right turn, move left, move right, and shoot. We've got a timeout of 4,200. I think that, I don't know if that's seconds or frames. I'll have to dig into that a little bit. Um, with death penalties, 100, and our doom skill is five. Now we can actually dig into this a little bit more. So what I'm going to want to do, let me actually show you the baseline environment to begin with. So what we can do is we can duplicate our defend center yeah let's duplicate our defend center notebook to keep it nice and separate let's that's the copy so let's rename that we are going to call it what are we going to call it um deadly corridor dash tutorial cool okay and then we'll open that one up okay so what we're going to do is first up we're going to load up the deadly corridor scenario so let's grab just going to go into there so youtube vizdoom where our current environment is and then if we go into github vizdoom scenarios all right this is the one that we want deadly corridor so this one here all right so you can see deadly corridor.config that's the environment that we actually want to go on ahead and load up or the scenario that we want to load up i'm just going to copy this close that close that and remember, it's reasonably straightforward to change levels inside of our flow. So all we need to do is change the level that we're going to be loading into our Doom game. So if I paste that in there, so Deadly Corridor, this should effectively load up our new level. And I'm just going to close the existing Doom game. So if we go and load this one. All right, cool. So you can start to see that here, right? Let me, never seems to want to drag. All right, that's a bit better. No, okay, it's not going to expand. But you can see that we've got a monster there. We've got a monster there. Now, if we run straight forward, we're going to die because these monsters are set to difficulty five or doom skill five, which is the, the hardest possible dif difficulty. And the only real reward that we're getting is heading straight towards the vest, which is right at the end there. You can't really see it at the moment, but when I make it bigger, you'll be able to see it. So if we bang straight forward to that, we're going to die straight away. That's just the way the game is set up. So if we actually take a look um actually what am i doing we don't need to take a look at that if we run straight towards it we're going to die no questions asked now again that's because of that doom skill setting so if we go into there so github viz doom and then go into scenarios and what is it deadly corridor you can see doom skill is set to five which is the hard i think that's the highest you can actually go so if we try to run straight forward we're going to die now we also have one two three four five six seven different moves that we can actually make so move left move right move backward forward and attack so we also need to change the action space that we're going to be working with um, and what we're also going to be doing is adding some additional game parameters down here when it comes to actually performing our reward shaping so uh, we'll come back to that in a second. So for now, let's actually just test this out and see what it looks like. So remember, we have to change our action space. So we've got seven different actions. So let me show you what that looks like. So we've got just an identity matrix. So there's one in each consequent position. So one, 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 so on and so forth. And then what we can do is get our game state, get our game variables. So right now we've only got one variable. Um, and then we can loop through our different environments or like actually going ahead and test it out so if we do this you can see we're dead All right you can see our health dropping let, let me make this a bit bigger the health is at four percent we're dead that's the vest right there that that weird thing over here you can see we're running forward health of 40 percent we're dead got shot again dead 28 percent we're dead it's frame skipping as well at the moment 
All right, we killed someone, so you can see that we probably should have got a reward. But again, the reward's pretty low at the moment, and it, it doesn't really highly incentivize our agent for, for killing them. So what is the reward for killing a monster right now? And uh, Death penalty. See, we don't even get any reward for killing a monster at the moment. So how would our agent actually be able to know that it should kill these monsters before going ahead? So that's really where reward shaping is going to come in and, and help us out. So we're going to fix that up or at least tweak it. Okay, so we have, we know how to actually play with our environment now. So that's all well and good. Now, what do we need to do? So we are going to close this game and we're going to go on ahead and configure our environment. Now, the first thing that I want to do is I want to get some additional game variables. Now, I, this is somewhere in the documentation, but I can't remember where I found it. So if I find a link to that, I'm going to give it back to or send it to you. So there's three additional parameters that I want to bring in here. So these are damage taken, hit count. So that's how many times we've gone and hit a monster. And then I want to bring in selected weapon ammo. So the reason that I'm going to bring in those specific ones is we're going to use damage taken to negatively reward our agent for getting hit by the different monsters. We're going to positively reinforce our agent for actually hitting a monster and killing a monster. And we're also going to negatively reinforce our agent for wasting shots effectively. So effectively, if you, if you actually go and hit a monster, that's going to give you a high reward. If you go and use a bullet, we want that to be negative, right? So you don't just waste bullets. So ideally, those should level off against each other. And we're going to weight each one of them um, so that we effectively get, I guess, the right type of reward. Okay, now in order to get these parameters from our game environment, what we need to do is go on ahead and change our config. So if we go into... Uh, YouTube and then or we go into wherever you've gone and cloned the github repo so I'm going to open that up scenarios and if we go into deadly corridor we need to paste those parameters in so I'm just going to copy that and this is without any comments so you just basically paste it in so it's a space that they're, they're space separated so I've got health I've got damage underscore taken I've got hit count and I've got selected underscore weapon underscore ammo. So now our game variables should actually include each one of these. So health, damage taken, hit count, selected underscore weapon ammo. Okay, so that is the first thing. Now, what I'm also going to do is while we're here, I'm actually going to make a copy of this and paste it in. So you can see, let me zoom in so you can see that a little bit better. So right now, our Deadly Corridor skill is still set to 5. So I'm going to set it down to 1. So I'm going to call this file S1. And I'm actually going to make 5 copies of this. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's 5. All right. And in each one of these, I'm going to sequentially increase the difficulty that our agent encounters. And this is what we're going to use to actually perform our curriculum learning. So in S1, I'm going to set Doom skill to 1. So make it super easy. Let me open all of these. Uh, let's actually rename them first. So this is going to be S2. This is going to be S... This is probably super small on your screen right now if you're watching this on your phone. Let me make it a bit bigger. Okay, so this is going to be S3. This is going to be S4. And this is going to be S5. So effectively, the, the full level of difficulty. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open all these up inside of VS Code. So we're going to tweak them a little. Okay, so which one are we on right now? So let's go to S1. So we've set Doom Skill to 1 there, and we've got our new parameters. Let's go to S5. So we're going to leave... So on S5, that's effectively max difficulty. So we're going to leave the Doom Skill as 5 there. On S2, we're going to set Doom Skill level to 2. On S4, we're going to set the Doom Skill level to 4. And where's S3? Let's just close one. All right. Uh, close that. And save. S3. All right. So on S3, we're going to set it to 3. And save that. So S3 has a Doom Skill of 3. S5 has a Doom Skill of 5. S2, let me reorder these so it looks a little bit more congruent. 
There we go, that's better. All right, so S2 has a skill of two, S3 has a skill of three, S4 has a skill of four, and S5 has a skill of five. And if I go and open up S1 as well, S1's got a skill of one. All right, cool. So that is all of our different configs now ready for our curriculum learning. So the nice thing about this is that all we're going to need to do is spin up a new environment with the slightly different config, and we're going to be able to use that then and there. Okay, now in order to make that a little bit easier, what we're also going to do is we're actually going to create a new parameter inside of our VisDoom class. And inside of init, I'm just going to create a, a keyword parameter called config. And I'm going to set that initially, I'm just going to set it to the S1 config. So if we go to this, I'm just going to copy that over. Paste that there. And then inside of this line here, so self.game.loadConfig, we're just going to change that to be config. So what's effectively going to happen is we're now going to be able to pass the different configurations directly to our environment. So we don't need to come back here and change the class. We can just pass that through to make our lives a little bit easier. Okay, so what else do we need to do? So that is now... So we've gone and get, got ourselves set up for curriculum learning. Now, let me also show you S1, right? So if we go to deadly underscore corridor underscore S1, that should be our really easy level. So let's set the default one to S1 over here. This should be really easy, right? So we shouldn't see our monsters going like ham and, and trying to kill us super quickly. Right, so we're lasting a lot longer. Let me show you this. Even though we're taking random actions, we're lasting way longer, right? Still dying, but lasting longer. You've actually got time to shoot the, the different monsters if you want to. Like, if this was on max difficulty, he'd be dead by now. So this is going to give our agent time to actually learn that he should be shooting the monsters. So right now, shooting a wall. So great, right? Okay, we can stop that. We get the idea. Um, and if we go to S2, you'll see increasing difficulty again. So if I change that to S2... Right, so getting a little bit harder. You know what? Let's comment out this so we actually see the real reward. So let's go back to S1. So all I've just commented out is this line here, which is printing out the reward per frame. So that's limiting us from actually seeing the total reward per episode. Right, so nothing's really happening there. He's lasting pretty long. All right, so he's managed to shoot both monsters. So in this particular case, if we were training our agent, he would have just got whatever the, the, the hit count value multiplied by the weight for killing a monster is. So he's going to learn that that is a positive action. But right now, he doesn't really know. I, I mean, there's no real smarts on here. I'm only going to wait for one game because this is taking way too long. And he's not really dying. Hopefully he gets into this area here because there's a monster with a... Um... Oh, he's managed to kill the mo that monster. All right, so you can see there that our result is 336. So that's for the first... That is with difficulty 1. And now if we go and set difficulty to 2... So remember, let's just write that down. So for S1, we had a difficulty... Uh, we had a reward of 336. Now, if we go and do S2, and again, I'm not doing this perfectly here because ideally you'd want to run it over a set of episodes. So let's see what our reward is over here for S2. All right, so that you can see, all right, so we only got minus 29. So again, you can see it's, it's already becoming harder. So for level two, what was our reward? It was minus 29. Let's do level three or skill three. Right, so minus 20. But you can see it's progressively becoming harder. And what I'm showing you has just, just the impact of increasing difficulty. So, so if we go to uh, S4 now, ideally this should be lower again. All right, so he's dying pretty quickly. All right, so minus 95. And again, they, these are all a little bit random, but you can see he's definitely not achieving 336. S4, it's minus 95. Minus, oh, you got 52 that time. All right, let's do S5. All 
Right, so minus 98. So he's not getting anywhere close to what he got in S1. Minus 99. Right, so you can progressively see that it's becoming harder and harder for the agent to learn and to get positive rewards. So that is what we're going to effectively incentivize using curriculum learning. So we're going to make it easier for him to learn what yields a positive reward. And then we're going to increase that difficulty. So he's already got an idea of what to do. He just needs to go and apply it in a slightly more difficult environment. Okay, cool. But that is all well and good. So we know how to go on ahead and apply curriculum learning. I'm going to show you how to actually do it properly in a sec or pseudo properly. What we now need to do is fix up our reward function and perform our reward shaping. So we, first things first, we need to change our action space. Remember, we've got seven actions now. So in this line, self.action underscore space, we're going to set that equal to discrete seven because remember, we've got seven different actions. Move forward, move back, left, right, turn backwards, turn left, whatever was in the config file. You know. All right. And then in this line here, so action, let me actually show you. I feel bad saying, you know. Go into D, drive, YouTube, VizDoom, GitHub, VizDoom, Scenarios, Deadly Corridor. I always remember when I used to watch tutorials and the tutor will go, you know, and it's like, no, I don't know. All right, so here I'm showing you. So these are the, the different actions. Move left, move right, attack, move forward, move backward, turn left, turn right. So these are going to be the seven actions that you're actually able to work with. Okay, so what's happening here so we've gone and updated our action space and so this means that when we go and sample our actions we're going to see that we've got seven discrete actions we went and updated our identity matrix over here now what we need to do is we need to create oh actually let's also take a look at our game variables as well so game dot get state dot game variables what was it again is a yeah, it should be game variables. Have we closed our game? Let's just re-initialize our game. I'm just thinking, yep, let's re-initialize that. Okay, so you can see that we've got all of our game variables down here. So I've just got state.game variables. The first value, it, these are all going to map through to what we've got. I wish I'd stop closing that config. YouTube, VizDoom, GitHub, VizDoom, Scenarios. And if we go into here, let me bring this over here and this on this side. Okay, so what are we looking at here? So this first value is going to be health. This second value is going to be damage taken. So how much we've actually been hit. The third value is going to be the hit count. So this is how many times we've hit a monster. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. There's max of six monsters, but they do respawn. Uh, and then our selected weapon ammo is how much ammo we've effectively got on our gun or whatever it is that we're shooting. Cool. So what are we going to do? We're actually going to extract each one of these and we are going to create a set of properties in our class to hold them. So let's go on ahead and do this first up. Okay. So we are going to create some, let's just find our init section. So, all right. So we're going to, down here, we're going to create... Let's just copy this just so we know what order they are. Okay, so let's create our properties. Okay, so I've created some initial game variables. So this should be self.damage taken. So inside of the init method, I've written self.damage underscore taken, and I've set that equal to zero. Self under dot underscore self dot hit underscore count this should just be let's just make that so self dot hit count that's fine and we set that equal to zero and then we've also set self dot selected underscore weapon underscore ammo and we've set that equal to 60. so now what we need to do is extract these and what we actually want is we want the change because what we're going to get back from the game is the current value at a point in time this isn't the change that we're getting this is the current value so if we've taken damage in one frame and we've taken damage in another frame, it's going to be the cumulative value. Now we want a reward based on the deltas. So we actually need to calculate the difference each and every time. And so why we've created these is we're going to store the previous state's value inside of this and update it each time to be able to calculate our change. 
Okay, so on that note, let's actually start doing that. So inside of this section here, so if self.game.getState, so right over here inside of our step function, we are going to define or perform our reward shaping. So let's get started. Okay, so before I go any further, let's actually take a quick break and see what I've actually gone and written here. So I've written if, so inside of if self.get, inside of if self.game.getState, so right down here, I've created two additional lines of code. Ignore this for now. Let's delete that. So I've written game underscore variables equals self.game.get underscore state, and then inside a parenthesis, so this is going to get our state dot game underscore variables and then we're unpacking each one of those values so let's actually take a look at what this would do so do we have game uh we've got our game variables up here right so what we're effectively doing is let me copy this so health comma damage taken comma hit count comma ammo so we're unpacking these variables so that we've got them each stored in its individual variable so now if we take health we've got health which is equal to 100 Damage taken, that's zero. Hit count, that's zero. And then ammo equals minus one. Cool. So we're just unpacking those values and grabbing them into individual variables so we can calculate our delta, which is this over here. Now we can actually get rid of this ammo line here. We're not going to use that again. So we can delete that. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we are going to calculate the delta. So the change in I don't think we're going to use health. We're not going to use health. We're going to use damage taken. So we're going to use the damage taken value, the hit count value, the ammo. So we're going to calculate the change in damage from the previous frame to the current frame. So let's go ahead and do this. And then we'll put together our final reward function and we should be done. Okay, so those are our different reward parameters now created. So I've gone, let me calculate that, calculate reward deltas. So delta is just change, right? So what did it change from the previous frame to the current frame? So I've gone and written six lines of code. So let's take a look. So I've written damage underscore taken underscore delta equals minus damage taken plus self dot damage taken. So this means that if we've taken more damage, Oh, well, let's actually think this through. So if let's say, for example, in this particular or in the previous frame, what we'd taken is 10, 10 damage points for it. So 10 DP. Then in the current frame, we've gone and taken, we've now taken 20. Let's add some comments, right? Then what this is effectively going to do is it's going to say, so minus 20 plus 10 that means that our reward is going to be negative 10. So that is disincentivizing us from actually taking damage. Kind of makes sense, right? So damage is going to go up. So it's going to be an incrementing value. All right, hit count. So let's say for, let's just walk through this example again. So let's say our hit count, let's say we haven't hit any monsters in the first round. So that's set to zero. Then we go and hit, let me actually make this a bit bigger so you can see it. Then we go and hit one monster in the second frame so this means that we are going to have a hit count of one and then minus zero which is hit count minus self dot hit count because that's the previous this means we are going to have a reward of one and again we're going to weight these so we're going to have specific weighting parameters cool makes sense all right so ammo which is this line over here 
So let's say our ammo starts out at 60, which I think it does for the pistol. So ammo starts out at 60, we then take a shot. So it goes down to 59. This means that we are now going to have 59 minus 60, which means we are going to have a reward of negative one because we are disincentivizing ourselves from taking shots that miss. Now, keep in mind that if we hit a monster, we're effectively going to get a plus one and then we're going to get a minus one for ammo. So they're going to negate each other out. So it's perfectly fine. All right, cool. So that sort of explains the logic for those, right? So we're just calculating the change. Let's actually take a look at how we've done it. So I've written damage underscore taken underscore delta equals negative damage underscore taken plus self dot damage taken. So current damage or minus current damage plus the existing damage we had from previous frames. And then we're going and resetting the property in that we initialize right up here. So self dot damage underscore taken equals damage taken. Doing the same for hit count. So hit count underscore delta equals hit count minus self dot hit count. So current hit count minus what we had in the previous frames. Then we're going and resetting our property. So self dot hit count equals the current value. Ammo delta. So ammo underscore delta equals ammo minus self dot ammo. So the current ammo utilized minus or the current ammo available minus the ammo that was available in the previous frame. And then we're going and resetting our value. Now what we need to do is just pack this all together into our reward function. So I'm gonna type in reward equals. Now what we wanna do is we still wanna utilize that movement reward. Cause right now there is a reward for moving around or moving within the game. So we're still gonna use that. So we're just gonna call this movement reward. And we're gonna set our initial reward value here, reward equals zero so that we've at least got it initialized, right? So then inside of here, we're gonna reset it and we're going to wait this. Now I've gone through a little bit of tweaking to find out which of these parameters work well. You might need to play around if you're dealing with different games, but these weights actually work well. So we're gonna bring in our movement reward plus our damage taken delta plus our hit count delta plus our ammo delta. Now, what were our parameters? So for hit count delta, I multiplied that by 200. So this basically means we want to really incentivize someone for hitting a monster. Our damage taken delta, we are going to set that to 10. So we're ta mul taking the change in damage and we're multiplying it by 10. And our ammo delta, I set that to 5. So in total, our reward is now reflected as, let's go back to this. It's reflected as uh, minus 100 for dying completely that's perfectly fine plus whatever movement we make towards the vest minus whatever movement we make against or away from the vest plus all of our specific values so that movement reward is encapsulating all of this stuff here then we're adding in our own special stuff which is our reward shaping so we're going to be adding an additional 10 points multiplied by any damage taken. We're going to be adding, or this is effectively subtracting. We're going to be adding an additional 200 points for every monster killed. And we're going to be subtracting five points for every time we take a shot. So this in disincentivizes us from taking shots that aren't going to be hitting monsters, right? Or should effectively do that. Okay. And that reward value should be feeding back down here. So I think that is our reward shaping now done. Let me double check. That looks good. Okay. Health. And I don't think we're actually using this health parameter. We could actually take that out of our configuration. So let's run that. Let's see if this all works. Okay. So no errors there. So we've gone and added all of our reward shaping over here. So let's just quickly go through what we've actually gone and done here first. Let me zoom out so you can see it all before we test it out. So we've first up gone and created our new reward parameters so damage taken hit count and the selected weapon ammo we have then gone and renamed our existing reward value to movement reward and we've initialized a value or a variable reward and set that equal to zero so that when we go and reset it inside of our if statement we don't get uninitialized errors all right then what we've gone and done is we've gone and written all of this which is our reward shaping so we've gone and extracted our game variables. We've gone and calculated our deltas and reset our properties. We've then gone and created a new reward function, which is a weighted sum of our room, uh, which is a weighted sum of our movement reward, our damage taken delta, our hit count delta, and our ammo delta. And we've multiplied them by specific weights to be able to influence how our agent actually operates. Cool. I think that's all that we need to do. So if we go and run this and go and initialize our environment. No issues there. 
So you can see they're going and spinning up. Let's just go and kill those off. So end task, end task. And then let's go and test out this environment. So if we go and reinitialize it, so you can see we've got a Doom guy. Close that, close that. We don't need that anymore. Close that. All right, so that's our environment there. If we go and import our baseline environment checker. All right, we've got some errors. What's happening? Viz Doom object has no attribute ammo. Okay, so what's happened there? So ammo delta. So ammo, we are unpacking ammo from here. Zero, one, two, three. Hold on, what's the error? This doom object has no attribute ammo, but we've unpacked ammo. Oh, because we've gone, sorry, we're, we're looking at the property here. So we've actually gone and named our property, not ammo. We've actually gone and named it self.selected underscore weapon ammo. Let's just call it ammo to make our lives easier. All right, so that should sort that out. So if we go and run that again, no issues when we go and reset, run it through our baseline checker. Okay, no errors there. So that is all looking good. So if we go and take a look at our state, no issues there. Can minimize that and then if we go and close it we're closing successfully so we can go and close this one as well okay so that is looking good guys so we've managed to successfully create our new environment we have gone and updated the config so we can actually pass the config in this time and what else have we done we've gone and reshaped our reward we've gone and updated all of our different configs so we've actually got a number that we can use for our curriculum learning so let's actually take a look at how we might go and apply a curriculum learning now. So we're going to change this, train our model using curriculum. And there are other ways to apply a curriculum, guys. This is just the way that I found is easiest to implement. Um, you could definitely try other stuff. Okay, so in order to do this, we are going to import PPO as per usual. We are going to specify our config explicitly. So let's go and grab... This is just good to remember what config you're actually using. So I'm just going to grab this. And I'm going to paste it down here. And what we can, what we're effectively going to do now is let me walk you through. So we're going to load up our first environment, which is this. We can then go and run our model, train it for X number of time steps. We can then go and change our environment. So we go and update this to be S2, for example. We pass through that new environment to our model policy or our PPO policy over here and then train for longer. But for now, what we're going to do is we're going to start off easy and we're going to use it on the S1 environment. So the skill level one. And this should at least give our agent a chance to learn in an easy to learn environment. So we're going to leave this the same for now. We might drop the learning rate. Nah, we're going to keep the learning rate the same. All right, let's run this. So that's all well and good. We have n steps equal to 4096, same as what we had before. And then we have a model. Actually, wait, hold on. Ooh, that was close. So what we need to do is we need to change our checkpoint directory and our log directory. So this should be going into corridor. And then this should be corridor as well. Perfect, that's much better. So we are now going to have two new folders. When we kick this off inside of VizDoom, train, we're going to have one called train corridor and we're going to have log corridor down there. Okay, so let's run this, run this, run our PPO. We are going to set up our new environment, create our PPO model and train for a thousand time steps. So let's kick that off. Okay, so we can see that we're logging to log underscore corridor and then PPO one. So as per usual, let's start TensorBoard in that directory. I'm going to close down the server. So we need to get out of PPO1, get out of log defend, and we are going to go into log corridor. And then if we take a look at what we've got in there, we've got PPO1, so we can go into there. So CD PPO1. And then we want to start TensorBoard. So TensorBoard equals uh, dash dash log dear equals dot. Cool. So it's running on localhost 6006. Good to go. Let's refresh it. Okay. So it looks like it's still training. All right. So let's give that some time 
and we should effectively be able to see the results of our model pretty soon. So I'll come back once the at least the first initial instance has gone and logged to TensorBoard. But this is good progress, guys. 11 minutes later. Alrighty, guys. So I ended up training and the results were pretty bad. Now, when it comes to actually going on ahead and training using reinforcement learning, things aren't necessarily always all that stable. And what I actually noticed was that when I trained it using those existing hyperparameters, the model would work and then there'd be a sharp drop off. So in the interest of helping you effectively get successful results, I wanted to share a little bit about what I learned, at least going through that initial first phase. Now, this actually took a couple of days. I dug into it a lot more to see what it was that was exactly or what it was that was happening. Now, there were a couple of things that I changed that definitely improved my results. There, I've also got a model that is performing really, really well. So I'll actually share that end model with you. Now, that being said, when I went to try to repeat some of these processes, it wasn't necessarily always all that stable. So just take this with a grain of salt. You might still need to do a little bit more tuning to ideally get that final end model, which is absolutely perfect. Okay, so let me share with you what I ended up changing. Um, and some of the findings that I actually found. So first things first, I went and set the self.ammo variable to 52. It didn't start out at 60. I think it actually started out at 52. The other thing that I noticed, I'll actually talk about this a little bit later, but that was the main change. The other thing that I was also thinking is that this should potentially be replicated inside of the def reset method. So that effectively resets our initial properties. I didn't do this, but I think that that is actually best practice. That being said, it's just going to be a continuing value. So it will calculate the delta. The next main thing that I changed was the hyperparameters. So initially we kicked off our training with a learning rate of 0 0.0001. So 0001. And we had the end steps parameter set to 4096. Now, let me explain what end steps actually is because I got a better understanding of it. So this is actually the batch size that you're going to be passing through to the actor and critic neural network. So it's effectively how many time frames you're going to be passing in total as part of one training run. So the larger this is, the more information we're going to be passing per epoch. Now, what I noticed after doing a bunch of hyperparameter tuning was that there was a bit of a relationship between that end steps value and the clip range. So just increasing that by deep, you're probably thinking, oh, Nick, just increase it. It's going to yield better results. That wasn't necessarily always the case. Let me zoom in on this. Why is this not zooming? There we go. That's a bit better. Okay. So what I actually found was that when end steps was high, you wanted to have a lower clip range. And GAE, uh, GAE Lambda, which is effectively a smoothing parameter, didn't really influence it as much. Now, when you had a lower end steps value, you definitely needed to have a significantly higher clip range if you weren't going to change your GAE Lambda and then vice versa. So if we had a relatively low end steps number, so a small batch size, then we could set our clip range to a little bit lower and we could have GAE Lambda a little bit lower. So the way I actually did this was through a library called Optuna. I originally had this as part of this tutorial and took it out because I thought it wasn't that important. Turns out it is relatively important and I'll share some information about that inside of the description below. So what I actually ended up doing is I took parameters which more closely approximated what you're seeing here. So end steps, gamma, the learning rate, clip rate, clip range, and GAE lambda. So that's what I ended up doing here. So I changed this parameter. So the new training line or the new model initiation looked like this. So we had PPO still our CNN policy environment, tensor board log directory, verbose equals one. And this is where the changes came. So I set the learning rate to zero or zero dot zero 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 one set end steps to 8192. This should be a function of um, 1024. So it's based on your mini batch size. So if your mini batch size is 64, which I think is the default. So let me show you this PPO stable baselines three. Where is it? So uh, batch size is 64. So it needs to be a function of 64. If you don't have it set as a function of that or a multiple of that, you're going to get this warning and it's going to say that the batch size is going to be truncated. So ideally make sure it's a, uh, a multiple of 60 of your batch size. So 8192 divided by 64. In this case, 128 perfectly. There's no remainder. So we're good there. 
The other thing that I did is I changed the clip range and I set that to 10%. So this effectively clips our uh, gradient. So it um, ensures that we don't have too significant of a change in the gradient that we're actually passing through as part of our PPO algorithm. I talked a little bit about this in the explainer. So 0 0.1 seemed to be an okay parameter. Gamma, this is our discount factor. So I set it to 95%. And GAE lambda is a smoothing parameter, which is used to calculate our advantage. I set that to 90% as well. Uh, then I actually ended up training for not 40,000 steps or not 100,000 steps. The initial phase, I trained for 400,000. Now you might want to train this for significantly longer, significantly shorter. This is an example of what your logs might look like. This isn't necessarily my uh, award-winning run or the run that produced the best results, but this is effectively an idea of what you can expect to see. So our episode reward bean is sort of trending around. If I go and smooth this out a bit, let's smooth it to the max. Um, so you can see it's trended up and then it's sort of heading downwards. Our episode reward mean, so this is episode length mean, our episode reward mean is trending upwards, which is looking good. Now, one thing that I noticed is that if you see episode length mean tank really, really fast and episode reward mean shoot up really, really fast, what that effectively means is that your agent is just running straight forward. So it's bypassing all the enemies and it's running straight forward. So that probably means that you've maybe overfit the model a little bit too bit or a little bit too much um and what you can do is reload the model from a previous set of uh weights which isn't going that far so that's one thing that i noticed as well if this tanked and this spiked really high then you've maybe gone a little bit too far and your agent's just running straight forward so it's not necessarily going to lead to good results when we go and apply curriculum learning um so we've got some divergence that means that our model is still changing and learning a clip fraction, so it's clipping, what, about 37% of the time? Looking like it's okay if I smooth that out. Yeah, around 30, what is that? Around about 35% of the time, so not too bad. Um, our entropy loss is going up, that's fine. Explained variance is going up. This means that our, uh, what is it? Our critic is starting to learn the determinants of future reward. Policy gradient trending around. So you can see that this is the reason that I'm showing this is that when I started learning reinforcement learning, I didn't really know what these charts should look like. This is a good example of training, which is kind of going okay at the moment. Now, again, this might spike out and blow out completely, um, but this is a good example of what should happen. This should keep going down, but not too fast. This should keep going up and again, but not too fast. Because if it goes really fast, it means that we potentially have unstable training on our hands. Okay, so what have I talked about? So I've talked about um, the changes to the environment, the effects of hyperparameter tuning, as well as the training length. The other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is I actually noticed that there is a little bit of a bug inside of the VizDoom environment. So one of the things that we used as part of our reward shaping was the hit count. Now, the thing is that if we actually go into game variables, so uh, VizDoom game variables, and again, I'll include a link to this. So we used hit count. Now, if you look, pay attention to this really closely, it says it counts the number of hit monsters players bots during the current episode. Not necessarily the number of monsters players or bots that you have hit during the episode. So this might mean that we're unfairly rewarding or incorrectly rewarding our agent, depending on what's happening in the state. Because if one monster kills another monster, let's say even by accident, it's going to get a reward based on our reward function from that. So that's something to keep in mind. I actually tried using damage count and this I think was a little bit better. And again, don't quote me on this, but I think that that was a better metric because it's the damage that you have dealt, not necessarily just in general. So um, if you're getting poor performance, that might be another thing to take a look at as well. Okay, so assume that our model's gone and trained, we've trained for 400,000 steps and we wanted to go and apply some curriculum learning. Let me show you how to actually do this. So the first thing that we need to do is recreate the environment and now pass through a new level of difficulty. So we can actually copy this environment creation bit or environment creation code up here. And the thing that we're gonna do is we are going to change this to be difficulty two. So remember we set up our config, all we need to do is change the config that we're going to be passing through to so that we've got the config with difficulty two or skill level two. So let me show you this. If we go into D, YouTube, VizDoom, and then where was it? GitHub, VizDoom, Scenarios, S2. So this is with Doom skill two, right? You can see that there. 
Another thing to keep in mind, let me actually show you as well how to change that damage count parameter. So all I did was change the value from hit count to damage count. I don't have this in this particular folder, so you can ignore this for now. This is just something that you could potentially try. So this is still hit count. Um, if you do change it from hit count to damage count, you should probably change the weighting as well because that's probably going to play a factor. Okay, so back to curriculum learning. So we've gone and changed our environment. Then what we need to do is we need to reset the environment that our model is using. So we can use model or type in model.setenv. We have a model. We've got one. And then pass through env. And then we can type in model.learn total time steps equals um, 40,000, for example. Let's see if that works. Okay, um, what's happened there? Callback equals callback. Okay, that's looking good. Model is not defined. Okay, so we need to reinstantiate it. So uh, let's create that. So then we'd go and trigger model.learn here, and then we'd go and run this effectively. Um, but actually, one good thing to note is like, how might you load up the model again if you've actually gone and trained already? So what we can do is we can type in model.load and then we can load from our best model effectively. So we remember it was inside a train and then train corridor. And then we can pass through the model that we want to load. So in this case, I've got a bunch floating around here. So let's say I wanted to load up the 70,000 model. And let's say that our model spiked, right? So uh, over here, we had a spike. We had a drop off after 272. So we might want to reload from 262. So the closest one to that is probably going to be 260. So I think I've actually got this in a different folder. 260. Oh, different folder. I've saved some of these inside of different folders as well. Just keep that in mind. So you're, it's not going to be inside a corridor test. So I'd pick up 260 load that model. So this is effectively preloading our model with weights. Give that a sec to load. Cool. So that's loaded. We could then kick off our curriculum learning. So this is going to load the new scenario. We're going to set the model environment to be this environment. So we've typed in model.set underscore env and pass through this new environment with the harder difficulty. And then we're able to run model.learn again. So we could run that and that will go and kick off our curriculum learning. Then once that's trained and assuming we're getting good performance, we could grab this, paste that there, and then we could change it to difficulty three. So paste in three there, kick that off. And again, likewise, copy it, paste it there, kick it off. And again, for the last level, so this will be Doom skill level five, paste five in there and then kick that off. Now, again, pay very close attention to your logs. So if you get those massive spikes or if you get tanks, then you might want to reload from a previous set of weights, which was performing well, and then re-kick off from there. I'm going to do a lot more research into how to improve stability on reinforcement learning over the coming weeks and months. because it's something that I'm super interested in? Let me know if you're interested in it as well, because I'd be more than happy to share my findings. But based on that, once you've gone and finished training, you're going to get all of your weights saved into the uh, train and then train corridor folder. So you'll effectively have a ton of weights here that you'll effectively be able to pick up and then go on ahead and test out. Now, I'm going to do my best to share some of the best model weights that I had with you as well. So you can actually pick those up and try them out. So you'll actually be able to see the high performing 560K model that I show in the results coming up soon. But on that note, that is how to go on ahead and perform your curriculum learning and just a couple of key tips on hyperparameter tuning. So the few things that I changed just to recap are that we went into our environment, we went and reset the uh, the self.ammo property and we set that initially to kick off at 52. And then I went and changed duh, 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 a number of the hyperparameters inside of our model. So I changed the learning rate, the number of end steps, the clip range, gamma, and then GA uh, lambda. So remember the learning rate is how fast our model is going to learn. The n steps value is effectively our batch size. Clip range is how much we want to clip our gradient by. Gamma is our discount factor and GA lambda effectively acts like a smoothing parameter. Then the other thing that I went and did is I went and changed total time steps to 400,000. And again, you might want to play around with this, increase it, decrease it, just pay very close attention to your logs because you want to monitor performance and see how it's actually performing. 
Then we can reload our model from an existing trained set of weights and then kick off our curriculum learning. So remember that the core thing with curriculum learning is that you're just gonna reload the new environment with the new difficulty. So remember we changed it to S2. We went and then set the new environment and then kicked off training again. But on that note, that about wraps it up. I'll share those final weights with you. Let me know how you go and what your performance is like. And if you see that there's anything else which influences the results, do let me know. Let's jump back over to Bob and check out our results. Alrighty, and we're now on to the third and final level, which is the deadly corridor environment. Up first is the 10K model, which absolutely sucked. And then we're moving on to our 100K model. So he's at least managing to shoot some of the enemies and he's starting to get stuck inside of that initial bottleneck. He sort of gets up to there and kind of just freezes when he really should be shooting the enemies there. Two hundred K steps looking a little bit better now and starting to progress a little further forward. And four hundred K steps, he's actively pursuing these enemies now. You can see he's got this bit of a strategy as he approaches the first bottleneck. He slows down and positions himself to one side of the corridor in order to be able to protect against the other enemy. And he's getting pretty close to that final armor now. And so we're jumping up to the model that's been trained for 560,000 steps. This is probably the best model that I ended up training. He's actively going out and taking out his enemies and he's about to get the armor and he successfully completes that goal. And as you can see, he's progressing further forward. He's actively doing way better than he'd done before. But you can see that if he doesn't take out those two final enemies, he won't actually make it to the end. So sometimes he gets pretty close. Other times he just sort of skips through. So definitely getting better. We're now upping the difficulty. So this is on Doom skill level two. You can see he's progressively moving further forward. He's definitely getting there. And what do you know? He manages to clear the level again. Not too bad. But you can see he's not necessarily clearing the level every single time. Oh, and he manages to get a shotgun and kind of goes a little crazy with this. And now gets a machine gun and decides he doesn't really want the armor. Just would rather go around like a crazy maniac. And we're now running that 560k model on skill level 3. Manages to get a shotgun again and kind of goes a little crazy here. Oh, he's back on track. Manages to take out the enemies and he still forgets to take out that final enemy on the left there. But you can see that he's definitely built up a strategy. The reinforcement learning model is definitely working and gets the arm. Oh no, he turns around and decides he doesn't want it. So we're now up to Doom skill level four. So again, this has been fine tuned on the increasing level of difficulties using curriculum learning. So even though the levels are harder, our agent is still performing. He's now managed to get, I don't know what this is, a, a shotgun and just sort of start spinning. He's aggressively taking out these enemies, manages to take out the last one. And that I think is one of the deciding factors. If he manages to take out both enemies in that final sort of, antechamber of the corridor he successfully gets to the armor if he doesn't get there then there's really no chance so he takes out the first two takes out the second up nope, see missed the second one and wasn't able to actually get there but still definitely better than what we had at our 10,000 step model
and this is where it all comes to fruition the 560k model on doom skill level 5 so he's actively strafing through those different bottlenecks to be able to take out the enemies before they see him and let's see if he manages to get the armor here manages to take out the last one that's the deciding factor and successfully gets that armor so you can see that as we use that curriculum learning, our agent is able to fine tune and definitely get better. Now, I'm going to share these weights. So you, if you want to try this out yourself, you can definitely do that. But you can see he's getting there. Oh, he's run out of health. So he must have been shot in the back there. Shot that first enemy, second enemy. Third, fourth. This should be pretty successful. Oh, no. And he turns around and decides he doesn't want it. But he goes back and tries to take out that last enemy. But you can see it's definitely getting a lot better than what we had through that first 10k model. The agent is definitely progressing further forward as our reinforcement learning model learns. And that's a wrap. So you were able to see how our agent progressed all the way from our initial 10K model, which was trained on skill level one, all the way up to the 560K model that was fine tuned on skill level five. Dude, that was insane. I know, cray, right? I can't believe how fast the agent was. Like seriously, I was surprised. Yeah, that was nuts. Wonder if there's any other techniques that could be used to improve performance further. I think reward shaping and curriculum learning are great first starts. I think we could also look at training the model on auxiliary tasks like enemy detection and using curiosity driven exploration to improve exploration of the environment. Huh, cool. Thanks dude. And thanks for checking this out. I really appreciate you sticking around to the end of the video and let me know what you thought and whether or not there's any other games we should try tackling. Thanks so much for tuning in guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. I know it's been a little while since we posted the last one, but again, I'm just getting back into the swing of things this year, but I do have a ton more cool game-based AI and sort of more sophisticated state-of-the-art AI videos coming through for you. Thanks again for tuning in, peace.